Okay, welcome everybody. Today is April 11th, 2022. This is the Augmented Curriculum and Program Committee. We are getting started at 4.01. Thank you for being here. And just so people know, we also, also have a Zoom audience. So those out there in Zoomlandia, welcome as well to this meeting. Unfortunately, folks that are on Zoom will not be able to call in for questions or comments, but the folks in our audience will be able to do so as usual. So welcome again. We have a number of items, action items and informational items on the agenda. Um, let's see, um, Debbie, can you take note that all commissioners are present at this meeting? Um, we're gonna go in order unless I'm told to do otherwise by our uh, Dr. Priestley. Um, so action items, the first one is board policy 5127, graduation ceremonies and activities, uh, Dr. Priestley. Good afternoon, commissioners, thank you. We have Bill Sanderson here today who will present on um, the, some, the topic of summer ceremonies for students. Welcome, Bill. Good afternoon, commissioners, how are you doing? Great, thank you, good to be here. I'm sorry, I'm... We were talking about Go that ahead. earlier. Um, and then I totally forgot. Uh, we do, we have uh, the opportunity for translations, interpretation services for this committee meeting in both Chinese and Spanish. So we're gonna make that announcement in those languages right now. Thank you, Commissioner Sanchez. Good afternoon, everyone. San Francisco Unified School District is providing Cantonese and Spanish interpretation today via Google Meet. So if you need Spanish or Cantonese interpretation, please dial the following phone numbers. Uh, for Cantonese, please dial one four eight four eight five four three three two eight and enter PIN number 721-609-895 pound. For Spanish interpretation, please call one three one nine three eight two nine six seven six and enter PIN number 665-996-976 pound. And this message will be repeated in Cantonese and Spanish. Sampanzi Buenas tardes. Si usted desea servicios de interpretación en español para la reunión de esta tarde, por favor contáctese a través de la plataforma de Google Meet llamando al siguiente número de teléfono. 1-319-382-9676 y una vez conectado, entre el siguiente número de acceso. 665-996-976-1. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, our interpreters. You may proceed, Mr. Bill. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so before you today is a change in Board of Education policy around students' participation in graduation exercises. Prior to um, the pandemic, as you know, students that had not completed the graduation requirements on the date of graduation were not able to participate in graduation ceremonies. We've had some significant changes in our graduation ceremonies over the past few years. Um, one year we were all virtual, um, and then last year we were, for the first time, and I am extremely excited about this, we hosted graduation activities at two sites, so sites were not did not have to find their own location and all of that kind of stuff for them to graduate. Um, and this year we will follow in the same suit and graduation will be held at either Kizar or the McAteer campus as it was in previous years. With that being said, prior to that, we prior to this, we also had students that went to summer school and they had their own graduation, which was in July. And when we started looking at this through an equity lens, um, staff came together and we looked at some data and we looked at some other districts that surround us. And we believe that it's in the best interest of all students to allow students 
that um, are going to complete the graduation requirements in the summer, that they be allowed to participate in the graduation exercises. They just will not receive the diploma until they actually um, are in, completed with their requirements for the diploma. That is the change in the policy that is before you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanderson. Okay, I'm gonna open it up to public comment. If you wanna comment on this item, please come to the podium, you'll have one minute. And then we'll open it up to the board, the committee. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners um, and staff. Thank you so much. Um, I just heard about this and I'm thrilled. I just want to say thank you so much. That is a wonderful, wonderful way to move forward for equity in our district. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All righty. So commissioners, any comments? First of all, um, this is an action item. So we are going, it will need a motion and a second. I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve it. Or, or no, send motion it. Just, it's just a motion okay. and second to hear it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm moved to hear it. Okay. I'll second. Okay, now we'll have discussion and then we'll vote. All right, go ahead. Commissioner Shu. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think this makes a lot of sense because the uh, colleges, as the, at least UC Berkeley does this, that they participate in the graduation ceremony, but then don't get their diploma until they actually can get their diploma. I have a question. Would this save us any money? Because you mentioned the summer had its own ceremony before. Thank you so much. That is an excellent question. Well, the summer we would be, we would uh, save the cost of having to do a summer act, uh, a separate activity for summer graduates. So obviously we would save some money. Um, I do want to say that we are very fortunate with some gifts from the city that we're able to put together the graduation for all initiative. And I don't want to uh, shy away from that. So I think overall it will save us money from having to put together a separate ceremony. Anything that saves us money is good. Thank you. And I also want to note to my boss, she told me I couldn't do this in five minutes or less, and I did. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see if we can hold up the other side of the bargain. All right, um, Commissioner Alexander, do you have any comments or questions? I wouldn't want to try to break that record, so no. <laughs> All right, so let's do a roll call vote on this item. To move, to, oh, sorry, to move this forward with the positive okay. recommendations of full board. Um, Commissioner um, Chu. Yes. Commissioner Alexander. Yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. The positive recommendation moving forward. All right. Thank you. Well done. Thank you for helping me out with that five minute or less goal. Okay. <laughs> Have a good evening. You too. All right. The next item, the next action item is resolution number 2110-1281. Uh, reading is critical to lifelong success update. Uh, Dr. Priestley. Thank you, Commissioner Sanchez. I'm going to invite our CNI um, English and Language Arts team um, up to the board. We have a very short presentation um, as an update to the board um, on this particular resolution. I see some old friends of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to have each of them yes. um, introduce themselves and their title, and then we'll um, begin with a short presentation. Thank you so much. Just make sure you just press your. Good afternoon, Lisa Levin, Supervisor of English Language Arts, Elementary. Hi, Susie Deploy, Supervisor of Secondary English Language Arts. Hi, Katie Eller, Program Administrator for Elementary English Language Arts. Welcome. Sure. So glad to have my team here today. Um, we have a very short presentation. We want to thank everyone for this opportunity again to share and provide this update. The literacy resolution was previously introduced to the board and sent to the curriculum committee for review on uh, two separate occasions in December 2021 and January 2022. And today we will um, update on the revisions made to the original um, literacy resolution and ask for action moving forward. Next slide. So in looking at the mission statement, I am reminded that the literacy resolution is truly an emphasis on the each and every, receiving quality instruction. Throughout the process of revisions and in collaboration with underwriters of the resolution, there were many agreements. We agreed that our students deserve 
the highest quality possible in their instruction. And there is a need for change. We also agree that our current status in teaching and learning, as well as our collection of materials and resources, are not exactly where we want them to be. The revised resolution is meant to be inclusive of all students and making them the center of this work, allowing for flexibility and engagement of an array of stakeholders in an effort to be fiscally responsible and correlate with existing processes that are already in place. Next slide. As you can see on the slide, this is an overview of work that has already occurred. I wanna take this opportunity to begin to briefly outline the work that is currently happening that a few may know and we want others to learn about. There has been a curriculum audit of our um, literacy materials. There has been a walkthrough of the teaching and learning in our classrooms. And there will be an update on that audit in next month. An early grades literacy pilot where data can be collected over time and focus groups engaged is already in the planning stages. We have a partnership with UCSF on dyslexia and there is a STAR early literacy assessment that is being piloted by the RTIFs in the spring. We are continuing to expand professional development on the best practices in literacy to bring those to our students. Next slide. Additionally, we'll be working with RPA in partnership to pilot a screener and collect data on this pilot. As you can see, there will again be stakeholder feedback as part of the process. Also, we are narrowing our focus in literacy on the foundational skills and word study. This is just a preview of what the audit has, has um, provided to us and how we can move forward. We are working closely with TNTP to help guide us through a process that will be extensive, that will look at valued research, other districts who have experienced high levels of success, and begin to work with us on building out criteria on how we can move forward. Next slide. And actually, next two, so you can go to the next one as well. We're all ready to our last slide. <laughs> as previously mentioned, there's a significant um, amount of work that is already underway with this team. I want to highlight that we are engaging our middle school leaders in a literacy pilot that will take place during next school year. We will continue to offer professional development and partnership with our university partners um, who, for teachers who directly teach with students. The revisions to the resolution are broad in nature, but they are meant to narrow the focus to allow for data collection engage a broad group of stakeholders, consult with experts, and outline a strategic process for materials review and implementation. This is all being done with students in the center. We are conscious of what this work means in the short and the long term. We want to build out a process that allows for long-term gains, sustainable impact, and the meeting of our mission. That is a summary of our revisions, and we look to the board for next steps. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, if you have a comment or a question re regarding this item, please come to the podium. You'll have one minute each. There's some feedback, I know. Um, So, uh, yes, when we have more than one mic, we have an issue sometimes. <laughs> I really want to thank you all for being here. Um, please proceed. One minute each. Please uh, press the button. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, one minute. All right. My name's Megan Potente. I am a former SFUSD teacher. I'm a parent of an SFUSD graduate, parent of a child with dyslexia who no longer attends SFUSD, and I currently am co-state director for Decoding Dyslexia California. Uh, the revised revision or resolution is, uh, will do nothing to address SFUSD's reading outcomes. 
and does not maintain the spirit of the original resolution. I'm gonna to cut to the chase because I only have one minute. Um, this resolution is a complete insult to the dyslexia community. Every single one of the 15 occurrences of the word dyslexia has been omitted. Dyslexia is a learning disability that is recognized under federal IDEA law and SFUSD cannot claim to be equity focused while at the same time put forth a, re a reading resolution that fails to even acknowledge and let alone address dyslexia. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Allison Henry, a current uh, a parent of a San Francisco Unified student. I was in support of the resolution presented on December 13th because it was a start on the collaborative um, solution to the abysmal literacy outcomes in this district. I am against the current resolution presented today. It is a shell of the spirit and actual resolution presented. The ineffective reading curriculum choices and processes currently utilized by San Francisco Unified School District must be abandoned in favor of structure literacy curriculum choice matters my dyslexic son outside of san francisco unified was able to make five years of progress in less than a year uh, while um, with the appropriate science back curriculum prior to our interventions outside of san francisco unified my son hated school self-harmed shut down to all interventions it is also imperative that we screen for the students um, to, uh, remediation becomes orders of magnitude more expensive as uh, time progresses thank you Thank you. Do I press this again? Sorry. Um, I'm a parent of a struggling reader who also was diagnosed with dyslexia. He has been through the entire system, tier one, tier two, and then tier three. None of them worked. He is now currently approximately four grades behind in reading level. That's with a parent who was strongly involved from day one. That's with educators who cared and put forth every effort that they could. We have to strengthen tier one in order to be effective for students like my son. By removing just the word structured literacy, we're not allowing that dialogue. I supported the prior resolution because of the spirit of the collaboration that was, it was a part of the process. It's allowed the conversation that needed to be had to happen. Now we are removing everything that I hold dear. Where are we, how are we gonna start a conversation if it continues in a silo? You can't do this work in a vacuum. One last thing, you need teacher buy-in and that includes general educators, SPED educators, community activists, this new resolution is not the way. And it broke my heart. Hello, my name is Rex Ridgeway, and I am here on behalf of uh, those parents who are, and educators who are against this. I'm gonna read uh, some schools and the uh, scores. Charles Drew, only 19% read at grade level. Bret Hart, only 8% read at grade level. Paul Revere, 19% read at grade level. Sanchez, only 18% read at grade level. And uh, Flynn, only 21% read at grade level. Why did I choose these five schools? Because these five schools were pulled out of 75 schools that the state of California has to pull away from Lucy Hawkins and f and and put them on structured literacy and find out if that's the difference of why these schools are not performing at grade level. So when we look at the reading resolution, the way it is now presented, Everything that mattered has been pulled away from it. Structured literacy and, and, and leaning again toward things that are not working. I read those schools because of the 75 schools that the state of California had to pick are elementary schools. They picked these five schools in our district to pull them away from what we were hoping uh, that you guys would have on the literacy uh, the resolution. And now that the literacy resolution <clears throat> has taken away structured literacy, these five schools now are gonna go to that and see if there's a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon again, Michelle Jacques Menegas, coordinator for the Parent Advisory Council. Um, I just wanna point out that the handouts actually, I think only printed every other page, so it's incomplete um, that was provided. 
Um, and I'm going to speak to you um, first as a parent advocate and encourage you to listen to these families that are here today and to all the others who have things to share about this. And now I'm going to speak to you as a parent of a former SFUSD student who went undiagnosed with dyslexia for her entire academic career in this district, who only figured it out on her own as a young person um, and struggled, struggled with self-confidence struggled with the ability to write well um, and succeed in her classes as a result. So please listen to these folks. Thank you. Thank you. Please do. I can turn, it's not, it's not your fault. Yeah, that's it? Oh, thank you. Way different. Hi, uh, my name's Tara uh, Sessa. I am one of the teachers um, in San Francisco. I don't have anything like prepared to say, um, but I, uh, um, I was one of the um, like original authors of the first draft and I've been working with members of CNI to help revise it. I just, uh, no one else that was working on it was able to make it because this meeting starts so early, um, but we'd all like to see the, um, working group be put back in rather than the uh, way it's written now. And uh, so I don't know, Alita uh, is on her way, but she's stuck in traffic. And we just really, we wanna continue to work with CNI. Uh, hopefully we're still invited to come talk about it because we do want to include that. And as a dyslexic myself, I'd really love it if we can get it in there once because I, um, I think that's really important. It's just one facet of who I am and one facet of who our students are as readers and as writers. And it is important uh, for that to be recognized. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Murray Metzger. I'm a mom to three SFUSD students. I'm also a psychologist who specializes in working with struggling learners, including many SFUSD students. and. As the resolution's written now, I don't think it's going to help struggling readers much, um, but I do ask you to do something quickly about instruction in SFUSD. Two things you can do. Hire a superintendent who recognizes the problems we have with literacy and sees it as a top priority and understands the need for structured literacy instruction. And ideally, they'd have a proven track record of making changes and likely difficult decisions to improve reading levels. And secondly, please insist that the literacy curriculum audit consultants present directly to you the findings because it's a hot button issue and I think your best chance of hearing unbiased results will be directly from the audit committee. Thank you. Hi everyone, Alita Fisher, Advocacy Chair for the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education. I'm out of breath because I literally ran to get here in time to give public comment. Um, I first wanna thank everyone in curriculum and instruction who's been working with those of us who helped to author this. Um, but I have to say, I think we're all very disappointed in where the resolution stands now. Not the work that CNI has been doing to meet with us, and, but there are no teeth in this resolution. This resolution, everything that we have been fighting for, for our students has been stripped out of this resolution as it's written. There's no accountability in this resolution. There's no mandate to do better. It's so watered down as is, it's worthless. We love you guys and we wanna to continue to partner with you and we recognize that you are doing a lot of tough work and we recognize that you don't have the resources you need to do right by students in this district. We recognize that everyone needs to be part of this resolution, not just CNI, and it shouldn't fall just on CNI to implement this. That's why we want the working group. We want shared responsibility and accountability across the district, not just all the work to be done on the shoulders of CNI. That's not fair. Each and every one of us should be accountable for all of our students and better reading outcomes and better success for our students. That's why we want the working group. Um, we recognize. Sister. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody for coming out to hear this item and to speak to it. 
Um, maybe Dr. Priestley can kind of take us through the journey of when this uh, resolution started. I know it was originally authored by uh, commissioners that are no longer with us, Lopez and, and Collins, and I think Commissioner Alexander's name is on the current one, so maybe you can speak to it as well. But where it started and where we're at, just kind of maybe give us a couple minutes of, of your thoughts. Glad to share. Um, it came to the board in the fall, this resolution, as you mentioned, through Commissioner Lopez and um, Commissioner um, Collins. And I want to say even previous to that time, um, the deputy superintendent and myself, Anikia ford Mathel, had been working with um, the um, commissioners around literacy. And, and we know that it's been a very big issue for the constituents of the community. And, um, and there's a lot of interest around early literacy, particularly in the work that we were doing. I want to say that I think even prior to that, when I came to the district three years ago, the top charge was for me was around um, raising quality instruction. That has been on the radar. Um, what I will say is six months after my arrival, <laughs> we all went into the pandemic, right? And so we have begun the work of looking at tier one, um, walking through schools, talking to our leaders, um, looking at where we had knowledge gaps and beginning to address those. And so we turned our attention to the pandemic, um, particularly from our office in supporting schools with materials, writing curriculum specifically for the pandemic, teaching courses, things of that nature, holding office hours for teachers, um, professional development. There were a vast array of things that were taking place. Now that we have been able to come out of the pandemic, we've had an opportunity to begin to address those concerns that have been um, in our community for a long, long time. And so um, the scores that the gentleman read resonate with me. Those scores have been in our district for decades. They're not new. And if um, and, and, and there's been work to address those. Um, and we need to be more strategic and I believe more narrowed in our focus and to do that. But all that to say, to date, how we came to this place was um, it came to the committee and there were various presentations, one from the ELA team and one from the co-authors. And at that time, beginning in January, we were given the charge to go back and collaborate and work through a series of revisions. And so we've been meeting weekly when possible um, for an hour, hour and a half at a time to um, literally basically go through the resolution and talk about the different points of it. And that's been very enlightening for all of us. I wanna say that's been, like gold, it's, it's, I mean, it's so much to learn that we can learn from each other. And I think we wanna continue those conversations. We wanna to continue to have folks at the table who are really invested in this work. So um, we've reached a point <laughs> where we needed to move this forward. Our community has been waiting and there are some contingency points um, that you've heard from uh, various folks that have come to the podium, and we want to acknowledge those. What we want to make sure is that we have a resolution that is fiscally responsible, giving our current budget um, circumstance, something that we know is manageable and doable, also has impact, and also will give us the flexibility we need to meet the needs of all students. So we're here today with, with that background. Okay, thank you, and I, if any of uh, panelists would like to chime in feel free at any time as well. Um, I just, I'm gonna open up to my colleagues here, but I just have a clarifying question around, uh, one of the, uh, several people mentioned that this dyslexia itself is not actually mentioned in here. Um, although there is mention of, of a screening tool. And so is that screening tool for dyslexia? Yes, it is. The so, partnership that we have with UCSF Dyslexia Center is a specific um, screener for dyslexia. Okay. We have been uh, meeting with them almost since I arrived. And again, we returned to the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, we have been working with um, RPA 
and we have approved a research project just in the last few weeks. We are looking to identify a school where we can launch that particular um, pilot in the fall. That pilot comes with extensive training for the schools. It will come with materials. It will come with investment from UCSF. Um, we're looking to hopefully um, launch something very successful with the intent of expanding that um, in the future years. Thank you for clarifying. Commissioners, questions or comments? Commissioner Alexander? Yeah, maybe I can just frame kind of my involvement. So um, I was asked to step in as sponsors this resolution um, when the original authors were no longer on the board uh, to ensure that it moves forward. And I think from, from what I can tell, there's broad agreement. Um, everyone, every single person I've talked to um, agrees that we have better, we have, we need to do better when it comes to early literacy work with our students. Um, those, the scores that our public comment are read, but we could look at lots of other data points that say the same thing. We're not doing, uh, it's not acceptable. And, and I think everyone has said that and we're, and we need to, we need to improve. And so, um, I think the question is how and what's our strategy. And I think that this is a, an important discussion and debate that's going on. And so I just want to say for myself, I'm not wedded to this particular detailed language. Um, but I am wedded to something that our staff can implement. Um, and I think that it's, and so to me, it seemed like the dialogue that was happening since January seemed very productive. Um, but, it, but it also seems like if we're gonna have a resolution that we can't just, it can't just sit around forever. So I think that's the intention here. I mean, if, um, it, you know, from my point of view, I'm not wedded to a resolution either. I mean, the work's gonna happen whether we write a resolution or not. I think the collaboration is essential. I think it's important for you folks to be at the table and to continue the dialogue. And it sounds like our CNI team is, is really eager and open to do that in, in some form. So that I just wanna say like in terms of an, as the author, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, but, but I'm not, also not wedded to passing a resolution that people think is worthless either. That's not, there's no point to doing that either. So I think the work is what matters. Um, and so just to, as an opening frame there. Yes, thank you, and I apologize for being, well, I am new, I don't apologize for that, but for, for not knowing very much about the background. I had a question of why was this resolution drafted in the first place? I mean, we all agree, from what I heard, um, we all agree that there's a problem, we need to fix it. Was it because it was not moving, we're not fixing it, and people got impatient, or is it too slow? What, why? I think there are, I think there are several reasons. Um, I think there is, in the last, um, you know, several months, seven years, you heard there are many references to dyslexia. I think that's become a very, um, uh, not, I want to say a hot and button topic. I think it's something that has grown in terms in, in people learning about it, um, recognizing that it encompasses a range of learning issues. Um, I think there's an opportunity to explore how we can um, build out resources in our school to support that. And I would say traditionally that has not been strong across SFUSD. We're just beginning that journey. I think this, um, um, I think the intent, and I don't want to speak on anyone's behalf because I did not draft it, but I do think there is intent to, to want to shine light and create an urgency there, and I think that's right. And so I, I think, and, you know, we know there's work that needs to be done, um, but in some ways that language is also limiting um, to, to how we might move forward as well. And so it's kind of the double-edged sword, um, but I want to say I think it's, I think it's more about um, expanding how we look particularly at students with reading challenges and how we might address them. Can I continue? Okay. So it sounds like that we, um, we were missing some specific dyslexia related um, uh, programs here in SFUSD and that prompted a group of parents and, and others to ask for that. But then since then, we have SFUSD, your team has gone beyond that to broaden it to more of a, a general reading literacy, not just dyslexia related. Is, is that 
fair our, to say? Our focus, and, and, and one of the commenters raised this, we really want to focus on our, our tier one. And I think where we, we know we need to start are the early grades. You know, we talk about kindergarten and first. Um, Minu would, I would be reminisced if I didn't say early ed. And um, starting in early ed and in pre-K and TK, how can we build um, strong foundational skills um, for our students so they can be readers um, by the end of second grade? And that's what the research would indicate that where students need to be. And we want to make sure that we can garner resources um, that can do that work. And I want to say this is not just about the curriculum resources. We have a range of things that need to happen um, that would move student achievement. If it were just as easy as the resources, it would have happened already. We've had many resources over many years that have not, um, I don't want to comment on that, I'm just going to say that, that we need to do work beyond the resources. We need to think about implementation, we think about need to train teacher training, um, we need to think about how we um, um, reach students across the entire school year, beyond the school day. There are many different facets to that. And we want to be all encompassing. And in some ways, the original resolution um, narrowed our focus so much that we might leave many other things out. But it also sounds like the original resolution prompted the work that ensued. And that seems to be a good thing. No, I wouldn't say that. I know Susie's going to be anxious. I'm going to let her comment. I would say, like I said, the work has well been underway for many years. And, and I tell anyone, you know, San Francisco is, is much like the Titanic. It's a big ship and it's complex and it moves slowly in some ways. It turns slowly. Like we got to really take the steps we need to take to make the work stand. Right. You know, it's not a quick right turn. And I'm going to implement this particular item or make this particular purchase and expect to see results. And I would say we've been building the capacity for a long, long time. I'm going to let Susie comment on that because she's been part of this work over the years and she has seen it grow. And I think, um, you know, she's been very committed to it, as everyone on this panel has. And I want to say to them, um, as well as to the constituents here, that they've been steadfast in making sure that we've seen um, steady and, and small, you know, um, bits of growth. And we want to accelerate those. And we're trying to think about how we can do that. So um, before you so, go, can somebody define tier one for me? I really apologize. I'm not from think <laughs> is the easiest thing think is, is the day to day destruction students the instruction the students receive in, the, in their core classes, English, language, arts, uh, math, social studies. Think of it as their, as their first touch instruction for their general education teacher that they're assigned to, their first touch, touch instruction that we receive each and every day. And then I assume then there's tier two, three, four, five. How many? Yes. Three. Okay. Totally. And those would be various levels of intervention. Got it. Right Thank up you. To, up to special education for tier three. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to um, state Commissioner Shu that we have um, a presentation that's available in board docs from earlier this calendar year where we presented about the dyslexia work that has been happening prior to this resolution. So that would be a good resource to check out to see what was there, um, what has been happening for many years. Um, I would also say that at a point where during our collaboration with our collaborative partners, one, one comment was made of, gosh, if I had known that y'all had done all of this, we might not have needed a resolution. So in some ways, some of the conversations we had and some of the information sharing that happened as a result of the collaboration really was uplifting prior work that hadn't been shared out or hadn't been heard. Um, so, so that's where I was, wanting to make sure to, to respond to your question of, but then you did all this other work. That work was actually, had already been done. It hadn't been shared in a way that was able to be known throughout the whole district, throughout the Titanic, as Dr. Beasley said. I'm not gonna allow us to use the Titanic anymore. Well, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like that we need to do a better job of sharing information yeah, <laughs> and yeah. also doing a, a do a better job of tracking progress because it sounds like maybe one is not letting the public know that this work is being done two is maybe still not being done fast enough for the public's yeah. <laughs> desire right so if we can work on both of those in communicating as well as either move faster or if we're not the big ship 
I won't say the word, um, or maybe find, um, define smaller, whether it's pilots or whatever we language we use in education here, um, so that it can go faster, people can see, and then with the intention that from the pilots, I, I, I hear that, I have questions about that, actually. Um, so that way, combined with, I'm sorry, I'm from the business field, I want to say marketing, <laughs> but uh, communicating to the public um, of our progress, I think that would help. Um, so, so can I ask the question about the, the audit and the pilot a little more? Yeah. Is this the TNTP work? And then tell us what TNTP is again. It's a new teacher project. It is. It's called the New Teacher Project. Um, they call them TNTP um, as their acronym. Um, we have engaged with them to do a, a literacy audit for this year. Um, I will say there has been no um, audit, audit previously, or at least to anyone's knowledge that I have been able to access, um, there has been no record of an audit previously. So for the first time, we've had a literacy audit, audit that reviewed our curricular materials in various grades. Um, I believe it was kindergarten, first, third, and fifth in those grades. And then um, just in March, we had um, a walkthrough of 15 different elementary schools in those grade levels, and they looked at the teaching and learning portion that happened in the classroom. And we've been working with them to um, review those findings and to begin to talk about how we can um, move forward. And there was there's there was been a lot uncovered. There's been areas where we know that we have strength, but we also know there are areas that we've had challenge and where we need to grow. And they've shared those with us, and we'll be sharing those with the board next month. Uh, and would they, without divulging all the recommendation stuff, would, would they include things like screening for dyslexia and perhaps changing or modifying the curriculum that we are currently using? I would say that is very spot on. <laughs> That's a, that was, I would agree, yes, some of those things are included. Commissioner Alexander. Well, I was just going to pick up on something Commissioner Shu said earlier and was asking about the dyslexia focus. And I think that is one of the tensions I see here where there's a group of parents um, and teachers who spoke eloquently earlier today about their own experiences and, and seeing the, the gaps in the system around young people with dyslexia, which is important. And it's something that we, it sounds like have been working on and need to continue doing better on. And those reading scores that, that Mr. Ridgway cited did not just come from young people with dyslexia. There's, there's a whole range of reasons why those happen. And so I think to me, that's where I see some of the tension here is if we're gonna write a resolution that's about dyslexia, that's one thing. This resolution, to, in my understanding, was titled to be around literacy. And if it's around literacy, that, that was why I was, just to be clear, in favor of the staff edit. So this, these edits were made by staff, but I agree to sponsor them because it felt like they were taking an approach that was appropriate for thinking about literacy district-wide. Um, if it's helpful to increase the focus around dyslexia in here in terms of the language, I think that would be something that would make sense. Um, as long as we understand that there's a whole realm of reasons, like a, a literacy strategy um, is, is, is much larger than that, because there's a lot of issues that go into determining um, whether or not young people learn to read. And uh, to, just speaking from my own personal experience and, and with 20 years of experience as a teacher and principal in this district, we've never had a really coherent, at least in recent years, when I would say, since I've been here, a coherent quality approach to early literacy in this district. I think, I think there's an effort to build one that's been going on, but there's, schools have a lot of autonomy. There's a lot of different things happening in different schools, um, some of which is working, some of which isn't working. And I think part of what I see the team trying to do is to really bring that together, um, learn from best, best practice through the, the, this audit, and move us on a more unified path where schools are still gonna need 
flexibility and autonomy to a certain degree to meet the needs of their student population, but there's certain things we know work, and we need to be able to say, this is how SFUSD approaches early literacy. Um, and again, we also need to be able to say, this is how SFUSD addresses dyslexia, and those are, those are related things, but they're not actually the same thing. So I just wanted to highlight that. I have a question. Must we have a resolution to do the work that, that we want to do? So thank you. That's what I was going to just recommend is that this be um, essentially staff work with community that's monitored by the board, but it doesn't necessarily have to go through the resolution process because if you're adopting the work and you're moving forward with it, it's it doesn't necessarily entail that we have to have a resolution um, um, in my regard. Well, but sorry. Legal, did you want to comment on that? Yes, I mean, the author can withdraw um, a resolution at any time and the committee, short of that, can send the resolution back with no recommendation or with a no recommendation. Did you want to ask? Oh, sorry, that? that sounded like the same thing, with a no or a no recommendation. Um, I am more interested in the work being done. It sounds to me like a resolution is a mandate. I think somebody even used the word mandate. And it sounds like it came from frustration <laughs> that you're not doing it or you're not doing it fast enough, so I'm going to make you do it with a resolution. And perhaps that was some of the way that uh, things were done perhaps even to recent times, but um, we are starting a new chapter. Um, if the work can be done and can be communicated and done quickly enough so that we see progress being made and not just taking years, and you've been talking about it for years, but nothing happens, well, I'm going to make you do it, that kind. So if we acknowledge that frustration from the community and we promise to do better, not just promise, actually, I want to see some metrics. I want to say dates and deadline because nothing gets done without a deadline. So well, can we put some deadlines, put milestones with deadlines and let's track to them. And also with data to support the results. You know, if we have a pilot, let's uh, show some before and after data along with the deadline. Can we do that and then maybe this dispose of the resolution, but replace it with concrete plans with deadlines okay, you, and data. You've asked four questions, so do you have a response? <laughs> we, first of all, I want to concur, we're very interested in collecting the data, and we, we are very interested in making informed decisions in, in terms of how we move forward, and, and really trying to understand if what we are piloting is working, A, with students, and then how we can um, support it long term. We can very much um, come back to this form um, as frequently as needed um, to update the public and to um, and, and to share those milestones. And I think that's something we should do. I also want to say um, I would still be very interested in partnering and communicating with folks who have been part of this journey because I think that's also very important. And I want to you know, be candid and say I'm more about being inclusive in this process than not because we do need a lot of voice around it and we do need um, different perspectives and we do need to be, um, you know, learning from each other and making sure that, you know, we are um, covering all of our bases. So I just want to acknowledge that, that, you know, if the, if, if the, comes there is um, you know the uh, resolution and, and doesn't come into fruition there's still I would still like to pursue that and and offer that yes thank you very much I have another comment on Commissioner Alexander's comment earlier is that curriculum and instruction should not be tasked with everything <laughs> connect it with literacy, right? Because I can think of maybe the kids don't come to school to learn. I don't know for whatever reasons, family, environmental, others. So I think there are other areas of SFUSD and maybe other departments that need to get involved for that. And, and I have this comment 
for the budget process to the budget department shouldn't be the only one moving numbers around. Everybody's actually be has to be committed to, you know, doing that budget. But same comment here is that CNI shouldn't be the only one tasked with this job. I think it takes a whole school district, all the departments, as well as the community to, to really work together to achieve that. But coming back, I really would like to see a plan with milestone and dates and data. Can we have that? So would you like to respond to that question? I think we'd be glad to do that. And I think we could do that as part of the follow up um, with the audit. I think that would be appropriate time, which is um, hopefully we'll be able to um, present in May. We are expecting to present on May next month. Okay, so we'll have it back here. Yes, at curriculum. Um, just wanted to mention because it's been mentioned here a couple times um, around um, absenteeism. And there is a link, obviously, if students aren't in school, then literacy is not going to happen at an optimal rate. And so in a later presentation on the safe and supportive schools resolution, um, uh, upwards of 50% of African American students um, in this in the fall of 21, 22 school year are uh, chronically absent, as well as the for Latino and uh, students, it's about 33%. And for Pacific Islanders, it's 66% for Samoan. So it's just what we're seeing right now is obviously catastrophic and it's not totally new, but the numbers have never been this high. And so we have a lot of work to do, obviously, in making sure that students are at school and in their seats and with their teachers and peers learning uh, together. So um, that, that goes hand in hand. We can't have, we could have the best literacy program and screening programs ever created, but if, if our students are not in school, it's just not going to work out. So that's for a later presentation. But um, I just wanted to also say that one other factor that that leads to some of the numbers that we we're talking in the 15 schools that were mentioned, or the five schools that were mentioned, out of, um, uh, oftentimes what's happening is that we have such a high turnover of teachers in the schools that we're talking about. And so it, that too, even if you have the best program, the best literacy program in the world, you will never get a toehold or a foothold on that programming if we continue to have this churning turnover of staff and teachers at those schools. And so until we really handle that, and that's a, bit, it's a larger issue, it's a contractual issue, there's a lot of things that go into it, um, we're going to continue to see these kinds of really horrible, horrible um, data points. So did you want to add to that? No, not add to that, but I have another question, which which is budget impact. So, I don't know. Do you want to comment on this? If it yes, if it moves forward, it will go to the budget committee, where and that would be the um, the subject matter appropriate place to discuss that subject matter. In the budget committee. Commissioner Alexander. So it sounds like what my colleagues are suggesting, which I would support, would be that we kind of table this or defer it and see and instead have a report uh, next month focusing based on coming out of the audit, but focusing on the situation of early literacy in the district. And I would say explicitly including dyslexia because that's something that's come up. I mean, I, again, I, I want to make that distinction that there's this this larger umbrella and then there is, it sounds like some concern around dyslexia. So I think you mentioned it before and maybe it doesn't need to be a whole presentation, but the, the, the presentation from before, I think maybe just bringing some of that back and kind of, as Commissioner Shu said, being clear about where are we at on that. And and so, and, and the requests I would also make are two, one would be, can we, Make sure that we look at some data. So we're thinking about what are what's our assessment of where we're at in terms of early literacy across the board, and obviously there's a lot of variation. But secondly, um, where are the bright spots, right? I mean, we've been um, Dr. Priestley and I had some conversation around John Muir, and there's some piloting going on. Where are the other bright spots in the district where it seems like there's some level of success, and what have we learned from from those successes? I think. Um, just so we're all also remembering that that there are pockets of success in our district and we want to be learning from them as we move forward. 
And just on, okay, and back to what we're going to do with this resolution, I just want to ask council, just in terms of process, if, can we table something like this and just have it be, be hanging out there, or should we? Yeah, I mean, it is an action withdraw? item, so it would be better to take to an actual action of yes, no, or no recommendation, so that it either moves forward or doesn't. It's kind unless of clear. The, unless Commissioner Alexander withdrew, withdraws, withdraws it. Withdraws it. I mean, it could be brought back because it hasn't been voted down. Sorry, if I withdraw it, it can be brought back? Yeah, if, if, if a, a resolution is voted on and rejected, then it like takes a different percentage to bring it back within a year. There's just different rules for that. But if it hasn't been voted on, that doesn't prevent it from coming back. It, like if the full board hasn't rejected it. And just to be transparent over what I'm thinking, I just want to make sure that if there's community groups or others that really want to see a resolution moving forward, that this was a vehicle for us. I don't just want to reject it out of hand, but it sounds like we're moving in a different direction. So if there's a way, so if my withdrawing it, could, could we could bring it back, uh, then I'd be fine with doing that. Okay, so we'll can, now? yeah. So he's yeah. so we'll consider this resolution at the moment withdrawn by the yeah. author. Yeah. Okay, all right. But it can in the future. It can in a different. Yes, form. it could be brought back in whatever form you're. You know, you get to after the discussions. And, and yeah, and I want to be clear to folks in the public and the community that I'm very willing to do that. And again, my purpose in stepping in the in the author was trying to have something that really did represent a consensus. And so I don't want to move forward with something that's that the community groups think isn't isn't worthwhile either so i just think so that's the spirit in which it's being withdrawn let's move forward with this process let's engage let's see how the, this uh, presentation and, and discussion happens in may and if there's a desire to have some different form of resolution i'd be honored to put that forward in place yeah and i just want to say that i'm looking forward to the audit recommendations and next steps with dates and <laughs> <laughs> actual plans and data, not just words. I think that's been made clear. Okay, so um, we are moving on. Dr. Priestley, we have three information items. Do you want to take them in order? Yes, we'll okay. be taking them in order. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for this last item. Thank you so much. All right, it's the, the first item is universal pre-kindergarten and SFUSD's plans for expanding transitional kindergarten. And then through Dr. Priestley, um, who are our presenters on this item? We have Minu Yashar, who is our chief of early ed, and with her team, who will and, and she will introduce them um, before she begins. And they will be presenting on the universal pre-K um, and the expanding um, TK program. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Minu Yashar. I am the chief of the early education department here with SFUSD. We are a preschool, the 12th grade district, and the early ed department is tasked with oversight of our earliest learners, as well as we manage the Title V contract, which is early learning and care. And that includes um, out of school time for TK through fifth grade students as well. And I am here with my colleagues who I will let them introduce themselves. Good afternoon. My name is Ingrid Mesquita, and I actually don't work for the district. <laughs> I'm the director for the San Francisco Office of Early Care and Education. It's a city and county department that funds universal preschool as well as birth to three and a lot of um, supports for expecting parents and children up to five years of age in San Francisco. Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Geisler, and I work in the Early Education Department as the Budget Director and Budget and Policy Director. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I've invited Ingrid here because universal pre-K has implications for SFUSD 
and the city and California at large. Um, and so we have a horizontal alignment and partnership with the Office of Early Care and Education. We are not the only district that provides services to four-year-olds, and that's what this is about. So the cover page, as you can see, shows you the different areas of um, the presentation that we'll go over and the flow. I won't read them um, just for time's sake, but you can see how the flow will go. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm going to have Ingrid um, go over on the left-hand side of your page um, the graphic that describes universal pre-K. Universal preschool uh, actually has been in the works for quite some time in California. And what you see the graphic on, on your left-hand side of the screen actually represents all the different types of systems that California has been working on for many decades. In San Francisco specifically, we've had a universal preschool system since 2005 with the passage of the Public Education Enrichment Fund back in 2004. It established a universal preschool for all four-year-olds living in San Francisco regardless of income. This was the idea to be able to establish, hopefully, the inspiration for a public grade. Almost 20 years later, that's what we have in California. So it creates an, an incredible access for all four-year-olds across the state. In San Francisco, we actually have um, one of the highest preschool participation rate than any other place in the state. And that's because we've started a universal preschool program many years before. So it was no surprise that back then, Mayor Newsom, now Governor Newsom, actually introduced a universal preschool system for the state of California. So we've been doing work with the district since 2005 in creating alignment, not only in standards, but also in professional development for preschool teachers across the city. And just to let you know, Ingrid will probably need to leave in about 15 minutes. So we're going to go fast. Um, so um, transitional kindergarten is actually part of UPK, and it is the vehicle for the school districts, SFUSD, to provide free and appropriate education for four-year-olds. By 2025, 2026, all four-year-olds will be eligible for transitional kindergarten. But Transitional kindergarten started in SFUSD uh, 2014 and 2015. Um, uh, currently, we've got 22 TK classrooms, and they serve four year and nine months old. So the, the plan is that we'll be rolling back the age to younger and younger each year. TK is similarly positioned as in K. It's not a licensed program. It's a six hour a day program similar to K. Um, although four hours is the mandate in SFUSD, we provide six hours because we also provide six hours of kindergarten. Um, so what will happen is as those students come into our programs in public education, we will be required to provide that TK as well as after school for them, um, just like any other elementary grade student as well. And as Ingrid said, it is a mixed delivery system and TK in SFUSD is that vehicle for the four year olds. So we just wanted to highlight, as they've been sharing, um, can you go back to the previous slide, please, that families um, have early learning choices and that we're working with our community partners to create options and best serve families. So transitional kindergarten, just like kindergarten, is optional. Um, parents have the choice to send their children there or not, and they also have the choice to continue at their current pre-K program if that's what they choose to do. Um, to date, we've had about a quarter of the children, um, both in SFUSD and throughout the city, uh, choose to stay in pre-K, even though they're TK eligible. <clears throat> um, by the end of the rollout in 25-26, we anticipate we'll serve about 1,100 to 1,500 children in SFUSD. Um, and we wanted to note that just because a child becomes eligible for TK does not mean they lose their eligibility for preschool or Head Start programs, provided that they were eligible otherwise. <coughs> um, and then we've been 
as Mina will share in a minute, um, partnering with and meeting with our community partners. There's about 6,000 children in San Francisco who will be eligible for transitional kindergarten um, in 2025. And we anticipate that some of those children will remain in their pre-K programs and CBOs, Head Starts, private providers, and the licensed and um, unlicensed family care situations that they're in currently. Um, and we also anticipate that we will continue to partner with them in early learning and in aftercare. Next slide, please. So as you can see, um, we have um, many uh, stakeholder sessions. The state CDE is requiring all school districts to complete a UPK plan uh, and submit it by June 30th. Um, but in anticipation of that plan, which we certainly don't want to do um, in, a, in a silo or in a vacuum, um, we are partnering with district as well as community stakeholders to inform that plan so that then we have um, added iterations every time that we share with the community and it go back into our work group and add to that plan. So um, you can see the variety of dates there, as well as the end date, June 30th, when we um, need to submit the plan. And then we're coming back to a, before that, we're coming back to a larger board session with all the commissioners to share the final plan before we submit it. Okay, this slide just provides a summary of the TK implementation plan. We're currently in the green column on the left, um, and students are currently eligible for TK if they turn five between September 2nd and December 2nd. At this time, the adult to teacher ratio isn't specified, um, so we've been having one teacher in the classroom and then a transitional substitute para um, support the children and teachers as they begin TK. Um, and the class size has been, per CD regulations 24, um, SFUSD has a class size of 22. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Uh, sure. Transitional, the substitute you talked about for the para, what is yeah. that exactly? Um, so since TK started, we've, um, we've had, we haven't had a lot of funding for TK specifically, but we knew that the kids were still pretty young. So for the first six weeks, um, to few months, they've had a substitute pair and they're just supporting the transitional process. Um, so next year, 22-23, the birth eligibility will expand by two months. So it'll be September 2nd through Fe February 2nd. And the ratio will change, um, so it'll be one to 12 students. So one teacher and ne beginning next year will have a full-time pair in the classroom. For SFUSD, it will be a maximum of one to 11 students because we cover classes at 22. Um, the legislation right now indicates that for the next three years, the ratio will decrease to one to 10. So at that point, we'll either have to take a look at having um, a smaller class size of 20 or adding a third pair, a second pair. Um, and then by 25, 26, everything we've been sharing, the grade will be fully implemented and we'll have a new year of free education for kids here and throughout the state. Next slide, please. So this slide provides an overview of our current capacity and the projected capacity for next year. We currently have 24 um, classes, 22 gen ed and 22 SD special day classes um, for a capacity of 508 students. Our TK enrollment right now is pretty low at 430 as it is across the district. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were typically over 500 students. Um, the classes and schools are listed in the middle column, and then on the left, um, the blue dots indicate where those classes are currently, and then the pink stars indicate where the classes will be added next year. Um, so next year we anticipate having 32 classes, 29 jet ed, and three special day classes um, for a capacity of 670 students. After the first round of applications, um, 700 placements were offered to families, but we in EPC don't anticipate that all of those placements will be accepted. <clears throat> um, and then the list of new sites is there on the, the left side. Um, so we'll have nine new, well, eight new sites because McLaren has had a TK. Um, and then the last thing that I'd like 
to show is that the, on the map on the right, the red circles um, are currently areas in which we do not have transitional kindergarten classes. So as we move forward in following years, those are the areas that we'll move to. Um, and actually, one last note, we don't currently offer TK transportation unless kids have an IEP. But it might be something that will change with legislation in the future. Just uh, clarifying about, I see the list. List has, is a Commodore Stockton? Is that yes, Commodore? Yes. That school is no longer Commodore Stockton. It's Gordon J. Lau, which is in Chinatown. No? Am I thinking of a different one? We have an early education school that is called Commodore Stockton. Across the street. Yeah, it's across the street. And Gordon J. Lau has a pre-K. A little bit of a side note, I went to Commodore Stockton when it was called Commodore Stockton. <laughs> So as the students um, become younger and younger in the TK, they essentially are the preschool students that were serving in pre-K, they will now be served in TK. And so that means that the curriculum that is going to be used starting next year will start to match the preschool curriculum. The state is expecting that TK classrooms use the preschool learning foundations as the guideline, uh, the framework for that curriculum. And they're all also augmenting the preschool learning foundations to include things like supporting dual language learners, anti-racist, anti-bias practices, and inclusive practices as well. The other thing that uh, CDE will be doing is expanding the preschool learning foundations to bubble up into third grade. And that is because of the preschool to, to third grade initiative, which if you haven't heard, you will start to hear. And that has a lot to do with the investments in the earliest learners and aligning curriculum and instructional services to meet those needs developmentally. Um, so with the shift to preschool learning foundations, um, there's a focus on whole child approaches to learning, not just content level standards, um, and really utilizing the environment as a way to uh, bridge and bring in inquiry and exploration. In those TK classrooms, we will also probably have some room for uh, rest time for brain breaks for students as they're much younger now for a longer day. Um, and then on the left at your leisure are curriculum that we already have in pre-K as well as in TK. And this summer we will be working with a few TK teachers um, to adapt that curriculum um, in preparation for the new school year. And then um, one of the uh, changes that Pamela had mentioned is that um, with the new legislation starting next year, there will be two adults in the classroom, whereas now the mandate was just to have one adult, um, whereas SFUSD did have that six week transition para, the mandate is now two adults to the 22 kids. The criteria for a TK teacher is that they have a multi-subject credential as well as one of the three bullet points related to early education experience or units. We highlighted the one about the child development teacher permit because we believe that most, if not all, TK teachers, teachers who have a multi-subject credential are going to have units that can count towards a permit, even a site super, supervisor permit. Um, so we're looking into that. Given the staffing um, shortages that we're having, we think that will bring in more, more folks and they have until August of 2023 as well to get those units if they don't have it. And then for the paraeducator, although the state says there should be another adult in the classroom, they aren't very specific on who that adult should be as of yet, but we're using the paraeducator A01 that we already have for pre-K. It has all of the criteria and experience um, that's needed for a developmentally appropriate classroom, um, but we're proposing a waiver to give Paris time to meet some of those educational requirements, again, because we want to cultivate talent in our district as well. Next slide. 
Okay, and then we just wanted to briefly share some details about funding. Um, TK will be funded through average daily attendance, ADA funding, just as kindergarten and other grades are. Um, we've had some interest from community partners, but so just wanted to reiterate that the funds can't be passed on or subcontracted to other agencies. We'll be providing transitional kindergarten here. And then the allocations per classroom will be, as we mentioned, one teacher, one para, um, a noon monitor, and non-personnel for supplies and field trips and time for teachers to meet, those kinds of things. Some additional funding sources that we know of at this point are um, the UPK planning grant, which will provide us with a little over 200,000 per each year of, um, of the rollout. And then ELO, extended learning opportunity grant and extended learning opportunity program funding, as well as a teacher development grant. We submitted a letter of interest for that and um, we're provided the opportunity to submit a full grant proposal. So we're working on that with HR currently. Um, and then there may be an opportunity for some funding for facilities. Next slide, please. Okay, I think this is our final slide. As we think about identifying future classrooms um, and this just this process in general, um, it is our goal that by the end of 2026, all elementary sites would have one or more TK classrooms. Um, and considerations around that are, of course, we need to go through the school portfolio planning process, which is what we did to identify the current TK classrooms and would want to do that as we move forward again, which is a partnership with many different um, departments in SFUSD kind of scoping out what makes the most sense. Um, also considerations for facilities, making sure that buildings have the space and the requirements necessary for a TK classroom, which are very similar to a K classroom. Um, partnering with HR because of, it has implications for recruitment and retainment, retainment of teachers and paras. Um, and then um, one of the really beneficial things about having a TK classroom um, is it's good for families in many ways because they can do one application to enroll, whereas currently now, because we don't have TK in all of our schools, families apply for TK, but then have to reapply again for elementary K through fifth. So the ramifications are one application, one streamlined process. And I think that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, open it up to public comment. If you'd like to speak to this item, please approach the podium. You have one minute. Good evening, commissioners. Again, Michelle Menegas um, from the Parent Advisory Council. Um, sorry, switching glasses. Um, first, would like to appreciate the staff's work on this initiative, especially Chief Yashar's outreach to the joint advisory groups, and we can see some of our feedback reflected in the update. Thank you. Um, some ongoing concerns do include the staff to student ratio of one teacher. Um, even with the ratio that's coming up of two, two staff to 22 students is really high and unrealistic for this age group. Uh, it's many more times the number of students to educators than the licensed preschool programmery, uh, which varies on age, but I think caps out at one to eight, I think. Or even the kindergarten licensed aftercare program ratio, which is one staff to 10 students. Um, there still remain some questions around the curriculum focus. Um, we'd love to hear more about that. And we know that children, especially young children, learn best through play. What will be the emphasis, um, playing to learn or learning how to be a good student? And when will we see the adapted curriculum that's being worked on this summer? We also appreciate the adaptation uh, of schedules that's mentioned to meet the needs of younger students, such as allowing a rest time, which we know is cr crucial. Um, and just for the record, everybody needs brain breaks, even grownups. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Um, commissioners, any comments or questions? Go ahead, Commissioner Shu. I have a question about before and after care. Sorry. Uh, How about I speak? No, still. The question is about before and after care. Okay, um, so 
So um, for currently four-year-old students who are in preschool get um, a, a nine hour day because it's early learning and care. Um, and it's because they're qualified for pre-K uh, because they work or families work or they're in school. That's the criteria to qualify for pre-K. As the students, these students now become eligible for free public education in TK, then that does have implications for our after school programs, right? We need to make sure that we have staff um, that are um, trained and understand how to work with young, young learners, um, as well as space for those students that are coming in. So we've identified some places next to the TKs that we know are coming out next year where we have OST and or Excel um, to look at and be strategic about that enrollment. The requirement is that we provide, we give families the opportunity to enroll in those um, after school programs if they need it and, and qualify. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. I would love to hear um, your thoughts on the point uh, Ms. Shakmanega has raised around curriculum in the, uh, will it be a, a play-based uh, curriculum? So we currently provide that curriculum in preschool. Um, and so it is exploratory based, small and whole group opportunities. It is driven by play, but it is an intentional play that is designed by creating an environment in which those teachers are guiding those students in that play. There are um, also very structured opportunities throughout the day as well, but it is based on exploration and using the environment as a space for that. So lots of project-based, play-based um, opportunities throughout the day. And how is the curriculum being developed or who's kind of doing that? Yeah, so we have a team very similar to, to our CNI partners, a group of um, instructional coaches who develop the scope and sequence. Um, and they, so they have, T, we have TK curriculum and we have pre-K curriculum already. So basically what we're going to be doing is bringing those two curricula together to augment what it would look like for the new TK. And we're partnering with a few TK teachers who um, want to work in the summer and would get compensated for that work as well. That sounds great. And just on that point, I mean, I think we had a conversation about this briefly. Um, do you have thoughts on kind of the, the our district structure with respect to that that kind of having two different departments responsible for curriculum? I mean, does that partnership work? Do we need to be thinking about? I mean, it's, it's always kind of confused me why we didn't why curriculum wasn't all happening in the same place. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like we we've talked about a little bit of how that how our our uh, your your department is kind of like a mini district in some ways, but. Are there ways, is, the, is that working or are there recommendations you would make, especially as you're? <laughs> Commissioner Alexander, that's like a topic for a- Yeah, we, if you don't want to answer that now, we could have a yeah. different conversation, but I was just thinking around the curriculum thing brought it up yeah. for me. So. No, it's actually, there's a lot of alignment. Actually, um, Ms. Levine, Lisa Levine, who was here earlier, partners with one of our coaches, Ravi Klein, uh, around the literacy scope and sequence. And so there is a partnership and an intentional alignment between our two departments. Our departments are funded differently and there are different compliance reporting to the state. Um, so there's, there's a part of that, which is why there are some two different types of department, but, but our, our we, we partner, we're constantly partnering and different folks are working across departmentally. We also did a math scope and sequence that is now, I don't know what the word is, but it's like other districts can like borrow it now, which was intentionally done between CNI and early ed. So there's some great partnerships that have been happening and will continue. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and it just, just so I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but just raising that as always as a question that we're interested in is how do we do this work most efficiently and uh, and really thank you for your service. Also, I just wanted to say that. Yes, thank you as well. Um, I have a question. <laughs> um, so on slide three, around the twenty five percent of families with TK eligible children choose or chose to remain in pre K. Why do you have any idea why that might be? 
Is it maybe because of the staffing ratio that there's more staff in a pre-K classroom than in a TK classroom? Like I, I'd wonder why they'd want to, they wouldn't want to be in the RTK. I think there's a few reasons. Like she was saying, it's already a built-in nine nine hour day for a lot of families, and they might have siblings. Um, it might be close. I think it's look could be geographic. Um, I haven't heard of anyone expressing like it's a specific curriculum or sh structural or staffing or staffing okay. issue, but more that it's convenience and it fits their family okay. and lifestyle. Well, I'm interested in the staffing issue. I, I mean, it's been one usually one adult, except for the sub that helps out at the beginning. And that's just not sustainable, we know. And so as this moves forward, the funding for that extra more staffing comes from the state, right? So, okay. Um, and then as uh, I just wanted to know if you know, and if you don't know now, maybe provide later, what are the outcome differences for students in our district that have attended and participated in TK compared with students who haven't, like students, so Latino students who did attend and participate in TK and Latino students who did not. Over time, what are, not just academically, but social emotionally, how are there differences? Yeah, we have a couple of research studies that we could share, um, none that were done since the pandemic, but um, there are positive outcomes, both for social emotional learning and for literacy. Um, in this case, it was T they did two years of pre-K and TK. So as we move on, it, TK will become pre-K. So they're not necessarily applicable as we go forward, but we'd be happy to share those, those outcomes. Thank you. With, That'd be great. Yeah. Provide it for the whole board, please. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. If there's not any other questions or comments, we'll, we're gonna move on. So thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Thank you, Manu, for your service with the district. Um, we, our second information item is online learning program update and 2022-2023 planning regarding a virtual academy. We have our Deputy Superintendent, Enrique Ford Morthel, who will be presenting um, on this topic. Hola. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, it will be me doing most of the presenting and then my partner here, um, Julia, uh, the executive director of LEAD, who will also be here to answer questions as well. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon. We are intending to just engage you briefly. Um, what we hope is an um, exciting update. Next slide, please. So as you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and as a response to California Assembly Bill 130, SFUSD offered a completely online learning experience to our families and students who requested this option for the 21-22 school year. Is it okay? Should I take my mask off? No, no, okay. I'm having a hard time breathing. <laughs> so today we want to talk to you um, a little bit about some of our learnings from that option and propose to you the option of continuing to offer a virtual option for uh, families and students beyond the 21-22 school year and outside of the AB 130 if necessary. Next slide. So just a little bit of background information. Um, in response to the need and interest, as I said, and in response to Assembly Bill 130, we offered three options. Our first option was an online learning program that was specifically for our students in TK through eighth grade. Um, and it was a completely online program where our students kept their school of uh, record, if you will, meaning they were still enrolled in their quote unquote home school, but they attended school online with another teacher. Um, these students were clustered by grade span and met every single day of their uh, virtual program uh, year or time. And they met with the same teacher and same cohort of students. They had a combination of both synchronous, live and in-person, sorry, live and asynchronous, um, meaning independent daily work. Um, again, that was for our students in grades TK through eighth. For our students in secondary schools, we leveraged an existing alternative program through independent high school. And similarly to our OLP program, these students engaged in learning um, completely virtually with a combination of synchronous or live or asynchronous independent work. And then finally, we um, offered an additional program called our On Demand Learning Program or ODLP. And this was for our um, families who um, didn't necessarily have any um, issues in terms of um, being exposed or having risk of exposure, um, didn't meet any CDC qualifications of being at risk. 
but families had um, perhaps some home situations or concerns with sending their students in person. And so for these students, they were also engaged in the online option. However, the majority of their work was um, asynchronous or independent. They would meet with a teacher um, on occasion uh, throughout the week for a maximum of about an hour. So those are our programs that we offered for the um, fall 21-22 school year. And our response to those programs have been great. And our enrollment in those programs, um, even with the various variants and, and different changes, has been um, rather consistent. Um, from that, we get the sense that even as things change um, with, our, with our current environment and the pandemic, we might have a number of families and students for whom an online option is the best option, um, an option of choice. And so early on, we started talking about the, the possibility of continuing this option even beyond um, state mandate and legislation. We also see it as an opportunity to expand um, our, our portfolio, to provide a more diverse portfolio of school options to our families. And what we know about students is that we have a number of different learning styles and types. And for some, a virtual option is the best option. So with that, we are proposing that- um, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I, can you just give some numbers on the enrollment? Because you mentioned enrollment is strong. Yes. So if you don't mind, Commissioner Shu, as I'm going, I'll have Joya pull that up for me. I don't have that at hand, but we can definitely have it before the presentation. I'm having a really hard time breathing you all, so I'm gonna pull this right here. Of course I wore the, the, the clingiest mask. Um, <laughs> it's cute though. So um, <laughs> next slide, please. So we started uh, earlier on just talking about um, just the possibility of offering an online option, again, beyond AB 130 and no longer just response in response to COVID-19. Um, next slide, please. So we've learned a lot in that. Um, and we, we are very transparent that our shift to an online option was in response to a crisis. Um, it's something that we didn't strategically plan for. Um, and there was a lot of uh, hiccups, if you will, and learning along the way. And we have um, continued to engage in continuous improvement and learning with this. But we think that we've learned quite a bit. We've also done a lot of research and um, listening and learning to other districts who have online options. And so we think we're in a position to actually provide um, a more thoughtful virtual experience. This slide just kind of highlights some of the key insights from our virtual um, model, and I'm not gonna read them all, but we've actually done a lot of thinking around what elements of the program um, of an online option we want to adopt or, or really kind of keep. What are some elements that we need to adapt or change? And then what are some things that we need to just stop doing altogether and abandon and possibly take on some new um, models? And again, the intent of this slide is not to go through each bullet, but to really let you all know that we've been really thinking about this um, and know that there's a lot of a ramp up and move from improvement as we move to a virtual option. Um, but we still think this might be a, a really good and makes sense option for many of our students and families. Next slide. So here's the proposal. One more click, please. So um, we are offering that SFUSD move from just um, having a virtual program option uh, to actually opening, if you will, in quotation marks, a virtual academy. Again, remember that for our secondary students, we already have an existing alternative option through Independence High School. And so students who are needing a virtual um, option can, can maybe access that option through Independence. Primarily though, we're thinking about opening this virtual academy for our students in grades TK through eight. We're thinking we would actually model this program, um, not just on our own learning, but some of the best online learning and best practices that we have to date, not just our own, but again, engaging um, with our research partners, as well as other uh, districts who have done this work before. We are doing a lot of consideration around how do we staff and align this program model to our physical schools. And so just a distinction is that, again, as we pivoted to online learning, we just were like, oh, they need some teachers, uh, need a clerk. At some point, we, know, we figured out they need an AP, um, but we didn't necessarily, we didn't have the option or the, the time to really as thoughtfully think about the staffing as we know that the program deserves. So for this virtual academy option, we would do just that, making sure at the very minimum it has what our, our existing kind of or brick and mortar schools have, um, as well as thinking about what staffing is unique to a virtual academy. And then finally, we know we have to do a lot of thinking and planning around the um, the actual enrollment of this virtual program. I think just, just for your benefit, Commissioner Shu, um, for our, our online learning program to date, um, we have um, basically had our students kind of stay as a, as a student at their quote unquote home school. So if I was a student at um, 
Charles Drew Elementary School. Um, I, I still am on the record, if you will, at Charles Drew, but I engage in my learning virtually through this online learning teacher. And at any point, if I decided that I wanted to go back or if my family thought it was best for me to go back in person, the school would have five days to return me back to Charles Drew. With this um, option, we are still learning more about what the legislation might require us to do, but our thinking is that this is now your school. So if you are a member of this virtual academy, you no longer attend Charles Drew, you attend SFUSD Virtual Academy. However, we do know the circumstances continue to change. So if a family or student needed to go back to a school, we would still, if um, possible, have that cushion in place, but you wouldn't necessarily go back to a quote unquote school of record. So that's a really important distinction is that this is now a school that students attend with a CDE code. Um, so did I miss anything? Or? Okay. The other thing to uh, share, next slide, is that I spoke about our on-demand learning program. And again, those were for families who, for a variety of reasons, didn't feel it was safe for their students to um, attend school in person for a short amount of time, a long amount of time, right? Um, and so we continue to have that option. As we move into this virtual academy, that would be the online learning program for our students in TK-8. The on-demand learning program would no longer exist. We would, though, continue to offer a short-term independent study for families who had issues um, that required them to be away from school in person for any long period of time. And so the biggest change I would say is, is moving the online model from a program to an actual school, no longer offering the on-demand learning program, but keeping the independent study program and keeping the um, secondary option for students to engage virtually from independent high school. Next slide. I wanted to interject, I believe um, 14 days is the correct number. Thank you, sorry. Yes, on that side, on slide, on slide that one, uh, it, there was a typo, so thank you for calling that out, Dr. Priestley. It says uh, no longer than 15 days, it's actually no longer than 14 days. Can I just clarify? I think it's me every time I turn one on. <laughs> it might be yours, yeah. No problem, no problem. Just this OLP and ODLP, I see the difference as being ODLP being TK through 12 and the other one is just TK through eight. Is that the only, I mean, other than this, what was the COVID related stuff and what was not or both are? I'm a little confused. So thank you for, for pulling me back. Um, so the, I used to say it so many times that I stopped saying it. The online learning program, the OLP, was for students who qualified um, for a CDC recognized diagnosis or um, had a contraindication, which means they got that first vaccination and maybe had a, a response to a reaction to it and so they couldn't get the other one. Um, and so the, the difference between OD, OLP and ODLP was really more so that, how did you get into or how did you qualify for the, for the program? The, um, and then, of course, there was much more interaction with a live instructor, you know, a consistent cohort of students, et cetera. The OLP was for students who did not meet those CDC required um, qualifications and did not have a contraindication, but their families, for one reason or another, felt it was not safe for them to be um, in person in school. So that's the distinction. The, the ODLP was for students in grades kindergarten all the way through 12. The um, OLP was for students TK-8, and then the Independence High School was the virtual option for students 9 through 12. Is that, did I answer your question? Yeah. Just to clarify, the, o the OLP is the one that you qualify for a CDC yes. exception? Yes. Okay. So the next steps, is that where we're at? Yes, we are in the next steps. Uh, so um, at this point, we've began an application process for a new CDS code. So for it to be a school versus a program, it needs a CDS code. Um, and we are planning and hoping to bring this in front of the whole board on April 26. I would say for the CDS uh, request, we are in the first stage. So we submitted the request and now we're trying to compile the required documents to, to have them actually review and approve that request. One of those requirements is this, talk to you about it. Um, and then also talks to the whole board about it. So that's where we are in terms of that part of the, um, the phases um, with the hope that the board will be able to take action on the item. Um, and we can work with our labor partners to think about human resources um, and hiring and things like that. Um, 
the other thing is that we have to hire folks. So the other next step, if this is a if this is approved, is to again work with our labor department, but really think about what does staffing look like and how do we identify staff. Another distinction is that for both the OLP and ODLP, in many cases there were existing um, SFUSD classroom teachers or staff who were moved over to teach the program, um, and that worked in some ways and didn't work in a lot of ways. And so now thinking about how do we make it clear this is not just for folks who couldn't report to in-person uh, teaching, but actually this is a full-time job and this is what you would be, do, would be a virtual teacher. So staffing is the next step. And then we want to collaborate, of course, with our partners in EPC to think about what does enrollment look like for this school. If we're, if we're talking about doing this for uh, the 22-23 school year and enrollment has already started, um, what does that look like for a family if this is approved to request that virtual option? Was that for transfers and things like that? So those are the three kind of uh, next steps that are immediate for us. Of course, the, the bigger next steps are actually designing a full-on virtual academy and making sure we're able to provide our, our students a rigorous program um, and our families ways to actually participate in this model. And that was it. All right, thank you. Um, if you'd like to comment on this item, please approach the podium We'll have one minute. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Michelle Jacques-Manegas again with the PAC. Um, I'll first speak as a parent advocate, and I'm really excited to hear about this um, virtual academy and to really um, be intentional about creating an online learning program that we know will meet our students' needs. Um, many of us have been asking sort of almost for the past two years, sort of shortly after the pandemic hit, um, what is the district's backup plan for any kind of emergency, whether it's a COVID surge or wildfire smoke or heaven forbid an earthquake, we live in San Francisco. Um, and I can see something like this having the potential to be a kind of program that could easily be picked up and replicated and perhaps support students in a situation like that. So there's hope. Um, and then I'll speak as a parent again um, of two former SFUSD students who um, struggled with mental health issues that greatly inhibited their ability to participate in regular traditional school models, especially in middle and high school. And I wish we'd had something like this for them. So thank you. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Questions? Go ahead, Commissioner Alex. Um, I had two questions. One was, and these are both about data. Do we have any um, outcome data from this year that would be useful uh, in terms of the extent to which students have been able to succeed in these in the online programs? So the students in this program um, take the LPAC, we'll be taking the SPAC and do the benchmark assessments. But in all transparency, we've had a really challenging time actually facilitating assessments in this virtual program model. Um, a little bit of that, I think, is you know, we didn't necessarily um, have as much time to plan for how do you do that and get the teachers ready, et cetera. I think the other part of it is that we were talking about this today in a meeting that we really are going to have to um, help shift the mindset and the um, expectations of this model so that it's no longer just, you know, my, my, I didn't feel like my kid was safe to go to school, but this is your school. And so how do we make sure that our families and our students understand the expectations around participation and engagement and attendance, quote unquote, and how do we also make sure our teachers are ready to support that lift? And so at this point, I'll say our data is all over the place. We were just talking to Dr. Kana, who was like 50% participation rate, if not lower in some of the assessments. So we, that's something we're gonna have to plan for to have some strong data. We're also honest just about the level of rigor in the program. It's definitely improved, Commissioner Alexander, but I'm gonna just always keep it real with you that that is something that we need to think about as we talk about a virtual school, what is different about ways to engage students, what is different in terms of the curriculum, just talking about the literacy um, and engaging students in language arts. And so that's all a part of it and with the hope of having um, more consistent data and of course, better outcomes. Thank you, I appreciate that. And then uh, my other data question was, I think I know that we don't have this yet, but but I just wanna ask anyway, we, do, we don't have any data, do we, on students leaving SFUSD and to what extent they went to other virtual options. I've just heard anecdotally that that actually is somewhat common that, you know, some people have left the district because they moved out of the city. Some people have left because they've gone to private schools, but then there's a chunk of these new online programs that students have joined. And so I'm just curious because this could be a way to kind of recapture some of that enrollment. 
I don't know that we have that data. I'm not sure if you've. We don't have anything formal, but I agree. We have heard the anecdotal um, comments from families who are asking to um, for their transcripts so that they could apply into an outside program. And we've definitely thought about this. Um, I didn't say this in the presentation, but you know, again, pro providing a divorce portfolio of schools is another way to attract and keep families and, and address some of the attendance decline that we that we know we're enrollment decline that we know that we're seeing. I also have those. We also have those numbers for you, Commissioner. Shea. Um, so over time, the online learning program, OLP, has stayed fairly consistent. There's um, 385 students um, last fall, and we're, we're at three, um, 317 at this point. Um, and then the ODLP is really what's fluctuated, like, incredibly. Um, it, I only have the numbers from December, which it was at 500, and now we're down to 389. Um, but at one point in the fall, when we were first beginning the program, there was over 1,500 um, students that had enrolled on the ODLP only, and now we're down to 500. So that was an incredible range. I think just to, just to add to that, um, we anticipate that the enrollment for the OLP, the online learning program, would have been higher, but we had a very strict um, criteria for enrollment because staffing was always a challenge. And so we anticipate that if we did make this something that was well known and, and communicated, we might actually see more families interested in this option. How big, did you have an idea of how big the virtual academy might be? Right now we're planning for two classes per grade level. And that's kind of what we have as like a draft budget. TK would only have one class per grade level. And then sixth through eighth grade would be four cohorts, not just three. Um, in order to have single subject teachers for each of the core content areas. And how many for independence high school? While you're looking at that, the, the, the two buckets of OLP and ODLP, do you have a sense of the breakdown of age range, whether it's elementary school kids or middle school kids versus high school kids? There was significantly more elementary age students that had applied for these programs than the secondary. Um, I would say an estimate for the students that have been um, in and out of Independence High School through this program is probably around 50 students. So the OLP and ODLP numbers are mostly elementary school students, right? Correct. Well, and I was just going to make sure that Commissioner Shu knows, I mean, independence is an existing program, too, with other enrollment. So it's kind of, it was both, right? Yeah. I, I do have something else. So it sounds like the virtual academy perhaps is an option for some parents who choose to do homeschooling. I actually did homeschooling for my son in seventh grade, and it was... Um, and I explored a lot of different online options. Um, so is that the intention also to maybe attract some of those families who choose to do homeschooling or go to the other other uh, programs? And are we, that's one question. Secondly is the curriculum. Are we making our own? Are we adapting? Or what do we do? So let's say that, yes, that's part of the strategy, right, around the homeschooling. We, as we thought about it, we weren't saying, like, oh, this is for the students, the families who want to homeschool. We definitely appreciate that there are some families who are considering homeschool for lots of different options for whom this will be a great choice. So that's definitely one of the groups that we're trying to capture. Um, I would say in terms of the curriculum, uh, we started making our own curriculum in, in the beginning, again, just because of the, the fast pivot that we had to make. And since then, we've partnered, um, particularly for our secondary students, and I'm going to forget the name, Edgenuity, no, Edgenuity, um, and, and one other partner that actually does online learning and had materials already. So I think that as we think about having an actual virtual school, a part of that conversation or that design would be um, where we get the curriculum from and what it would be. But we're also really mindful to make sure that um, if we were to partner with anyone around the curriculum, we want there to be some very tight alignment between what we're doing 
and what students are getting in our brick and mortar school and what they're getting in the, um, in the virtual school. Maybe not the same um, mode of, 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 of teaching and communication for lots of obvious reasons, but the content itself should stay as consistent and aligned as possible as we move forward towards more instructional coherence. But we also want our students to be able to move in and out, well, not in and out. We want them to, if they were to come out of the virtual school and go to a traditional brick and mortar school, we want there to be that, that easy transition as much as possible, so. I just have a, a couple questions myself. Um, one is the demographics of the students that um, attend both those programs. Do we have that at hand? If you don't, you can just forward it to the board at a later date, that'd be great. I've just heard anecdotally from folks who work in it. Um, and then on the fifth slide around uh, key insights from SFUSD, the abandoned column or box, um, the last bullet is duplicating the student count causes us to pay for more teachers than needed. I'm at, Pulling that out because I'm wondering about the fiscal viability moving forward. It sounds like we're overstaffed. Um, is that accurate to say for the programs right now? And you're identifying the this as part of the that um, overstaffing is because it's duplicating. Can you just talk a little yeah, bit about that? And I'm happy to let Joya jump in. But you know, one of the things again is that for this model, for the for the virtual program. We're, we're still holding a student seat um, at their quote unquote home school and in that classroom, right? And so a teacher, um, I'm still in that teacher's roster. So, I'm, so I'm, I might be a teacher who has five students who are participating in the online learning program. And those five seats are still in my, sit, in my, in my classroom empty. And this, the district or my principal is not allowed to put anyone else in that seat. And so in that way, it's not as cost efficient because I'm holding spots for students that I'm also paying for to go into this online learning program with the teacher that we're paying a salary for as well. That is correct. And then um, because we were so, um, had such a wide variety at the beginning, right now we have some classes where the teacher is only responsible for six students. And so it, and there's multiple okay. teachers where that is the Obviously case. Obviously that's not okay. Yeah. And so as we are learning, right, through, through this year, um, we want to make a recommendation that um, aligns with our current staffing to student ratios, which is 22 at the lower grades and then 33 at the secondary space. And then moving forward, we wouldn't hold open those seats. At a, that's just not gonna happen. Okay, great. And again, we're still getting more, uh, more clear guidance around AB 130 and what it will require. And there's some, some questions marks if they're gonna still require that with the request that we have to move students back somewhere in five days. All right, unless there's no other questions. Okay, we're going to move on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the last item under information is update on implementation of resolution number 1312-10A4, establishment of a safe and supportive schools policy in the San Francisco Unified School District. And just as you prepare to present this, I noticed that there's a, a number of acronyms in this report that might want you might want to spell out for us and the public. Thank you, Commissioner Champez, uh, Sanchez. We have Chief Melee Lau Smith, um, and she'll introduce who's with her team um, in this safe and supportive schools presentation. Thank you, welcome. I would just say that there's a, there's a number of acronyms that I'd like you to just spell them out for us. Thank you. And, and, and also, you're going to need to press the button for your microphone. There it goes, green. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to present to the curriculum committee. I believe we will also be making a similar presentation to the full board at the end of April as part of the um, two annual updates for the safe and supportive resolution. Uh, my name is Mele Lau Smith, and I'm with the Student and Family Services Division. And what I wanted to do today was sort of provide an overview of the resolution itself and the status of the actions um, as part of this resolution, which I believe was adopted by the board in February 2014. So can we go to the next slide, please? 
So as you can see, um, the resolution actions, those are taken directly from the safe and supportive schools policy. And then you can see on the other side, um, this, uh, the right side of the columns is what we have done. So uh, the first part, um, which was a very large community stakeholder process and a long process was developing the tiered behavioral discipline matrix, which is now embedded in the board policy 5144, and it is also part of the student family handbook. Uh, at the same time, we also updated the board policy to ensure that there was no um, suspension or expulsion solely on the basis of disruption and defiance. Um, at the time that this policy was passed, that was also a policy that was passed statewide. And so no longer um, since 2014 can schools uh, suspend or expel a student solely on the basis of disruption or defiance. Uh, the other part was that we really wanted to look at ensuring that restorative practices and positive behavior um, intervention uh, supports, which included training and professional development, would be available to all teachers and educators throughout the district. This has not happened um, it has been made available. However, the funding for these types of trainings has sort of um, been up and down. Initially, there was funding through the SACE, and you're going to have to help me, um, Deputy Superintendent Ford Morthel, CEIS, what does it stand for? We just talked about it this afternoon. Okay, I can't remember. <laughs> these funds. Um, so these funds, what happens is when a school district is found disproportionate and it's discipline for special education students, either discipline or even um, referral to special education services, a certain portion of these funds can go towards general education supports. So um, from about 2016 to about 2020, there was about a million dollars in these funds that were dedicated towards professional development opportunities for restorative practices and positive behavior intervention supports. Um, those funds um, sunsetted on June 30th, 2020, and these funds are now being used for literacy work um, that we've just started uh, in the district. So that funding went away and those um, staffing positions and the support for those fundings also went away. You go to the next slide, please. Oh, SACE, Coordinated <laughs> Early Intervention Services. So that's what that stands for. Go to the next. Oh, yeah, you did already. Okay, and part of the resolution asks for schools to develop a school-based team to plan and guide the implementation efforts. Schools were never provided specific funding to establish the school-wide team. So what schools did was sort of rely on the existing um, teams that they already had in place. And some of them, at many of our schools, the name of this team could be called something different. It could be the culture and climate team the climate team, the discipline team, the instructional leadership team. It looks different at different schools, but in the absence of funding, schools were creative to see where this um, work could land. The other work was um, each school would establish sort of behavior expectations that were specific to a school. And this work really were, happened in earnest, I would say probably in 15, 16, and 16, and 17. And I would say that many, if not all schools have developed them. So like if you go to a school and say, maybe you can remember from Cleveland what it was, there were usually- Safe, safe responsible, and there was one other term. Well, right, so there were usually three of them, you know, however, um, and they were always like, what do you do positively versus don't run in the hallways? It was be safe and respectful in the hallways or that type of thing. So it was really focused on positive behaviors. It was just co common messaging throughout the school, exactly. in the classroom, in the common areas, in, exactly. the, in the playground. So I would say that um, when you walk around our schools today, you will often see the different signs. And so this was a school-wide process where students were part of it and families were part of it. And that that's the idea is to provide the create these behavior expectations together. Um, the another part was to integrate um, restorative practices and school-wide positive behavior intervention services with response to intervention. This is work that is to address the division the disproportionality in the special education referrals. Um, this is work that continues today, and this is work that um, is part of what the SACE plan is, is focusing on. 
And then again, there was really wanting schools to consistently spend time building trusting relationships among their communities. And there was a family partnership model that was developed based on student and family input. It was like a year long process of developing this model. And it's really grounded in partnership with families and students. Again, there wasn't dedicated funding to push this out to all schools, but there has been consistent um, availability of training for schools that um, participated in it. Can you go to the next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that just to dig in a little bit uh, more deeply on what the 1 million in SACE fundings, and that was annual for about five years. It provided coaching hours. So there were um, staff that were hired as restorative practices coaches or culture and climate coaches, and they could go to a school and support the administration of what was called the tiered fatality inventory. And that is a, a tool that you would um, complete in the fall you would do an assessment of how well we were implementing the different um, positive behavior intervention systems with what fidelity and identify areas of improvement. And then you would do the inventory again in the spring. And this was the one tool that would measure if you were about 85% um, implementing all of the different interventions, then we should start having um, an impact on suspensions or expulsions um, and referrals to special education. The funding also provided substitutes. That's a really big thing that needs to happen in our district to allow um, school site staff to attend um, trainings is to have a substitute to attend these different trainings that were offered. Uh, one of the challenges with this is also that we have a limited number of substitutes and there are times when we had to, um, there were, I guess I would call blackout dates for certain types of training. So you'd have to work around um, the availability of substitutes to provide the trainings. The other thing it provided was extended hours for school staff who, who opted in to attend safety care trainings. And that is the training to, um, for verbal and physical de-escalation techniques. Um, and those trainings were offered monthly and the training was actually a one week training. So it was a, a significant um, investment of time. Those trainings are now offered through the Special Education Services Department. You go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> This was in the spring of 2019, um, the Board of Education, the commissioners requested that we give an idea of like, what would it cost to have um, a climate team lead at our tier one, three schools at, the, at that time, and then maybe give a stipend, which is just, it's not funding an actual person, but giving a person at the school site who um, agrees to be part of this team, a stipend for being part of that team. So we provided um, this estimate, though we were not able to within the budget constraints and resources and the competing uh, resources be able to allocate these funds for it. But I did wanna share that again, because that has come up a couple of times. And next slide. So what we were able to do in the fall of 2019 was um, for the first time, we were able to implement baseline data on what was happening at school sites around restorative practices. We had spent about a year, 2018, 2019, sort of pausing and looking at the different interventions and what was the information we had. So we were able to determine in the fall of 2019 that, um, most school, all schools had a climate team and um, we were engaged in a year long professional learning community around it. And um, most of the teams had members who were trained in restorative practices. There were very few teams that the members weren't trained. And again, this was in the fall, so they could have taken the training through that school year. This was a baseline. Um, we had a- Sorry, sorry can I just ask a clarifying sure. on this? Is this percentages of all schools? So like, you know what I'm saying? Like Every all school that had a climate team, and I think they were almost all, I'd have to go back and look at the data to make sure that it is all schools. So I can get back but to base, that. But essentially, or, but it, these percentages on these pages are like of, of, all, of schools. all schools, basically, more or less. Yes, okay, pretty thanks. much. Um, and then you could see on the other one, the restorative practice training and implementation, um, which um, teams, like we had, which was really exciting. Like some team members have, a have attended the um, 
training and delivered the one hour RP. So again, we were moving towards the training of the trainer model because we, were, we did not have the funding we had to provide trainings at school sites. So we had 24% um, is pretty good if you're looking in, the, in when the school just started that people attended a training and then went back and did their training with their staff. You can go to the next slide, please. The same thing we did was sort of look at um, proactive classroom community building circles. There's, there's, that's really a cornerstone of restorative practices because really the first part of restorative practices is to build a community so that when harm is done, you have, you have a community to restore. So really spending a lot of time with um, school staff on how do you have classroom circles in your classroom that don't have to be about, that are about building community, not about restoring harm so that when something happens, you can have what are called impromptu restorative conversations. And those are some of the most critical skills to have is those impromptu restorative um, conversations because often, as we were talking earlier about sort of tier one, tier two, and tier three, these are very much tier one interventions because they can prevent harm from being done if you're developing all of these proactive community building um, practices. And so you can see that uh, we had some, you know, 80% of the teachers had been trained. Um, some were um, practicing, but not practicing consistently. So this kid just was giving us a, this was the first time we had had a picture of what was happening with restorative practices across the district. Uh, go to the next slide. Can you, I'm sorry, they're a little out of order. Can I ask you go to the next slide and then I'm going to come back to this one. Okay, so then that was the fall of 2019 and then we all know what happened in the spring of 2020. Um, we had the COVID school closures on March 16th, 2020. Um, going into, we were also, um, that was the last year, um, that spring that we had that SACE funding. So the following year, there was about a $4.2 million cut to the division. And so we lost um, a lot of the staff who were supporting restorative practices. We did, the board did pass a, during in the summer of 2020 as part of a response to the pandemic, the um, trauma-informed coordinated care approach, which included restorative practices. So we started pivoting some of the restorative practices around a coordinated care approach. Uh, we were in distance learning for almost a year. And during that time, we also really as a district um, recommitted to anti-racist practices and spent some time across all of our divisions and departments doing what we called interrogating our pro programs and practices um, in anti-racist practices. And we did some shifts and changes to some of the work in the restorative practices um, curriculum because it was identified as being, as having some white supremacist characteristics, specifically paternalism and um, I'm the only way and we can share those audits with you. So we did that um, during the pandemic. And then can you go back to the next the slide that I asked you to skip? So when we came out of um, return to in-person learning in the spring of 2021 and then more deeply into the fall of 21, um, 2021, we developed what is called the Coordinated Care Team Co-Leads Implementation Guide. Like the uh, family partnership model, it was also developed in collaboration with a family advisory body. We brought together students and families to identify with them what would coordinated care approach look like at our school districts. Uh, we provided this in the Admin Institute to school site leaders. Um, there were nuts and bolts trainings in the fall of 21, that's September 21st and September 23rd, not um, years. <laughs> Uh, we created restorative practices, planning guides and resources, um, trainings on de-escalation, but because we didn't have dedicated funding, all of, all of these trainings were provided um, either through what we call the independent learning modules that folks complete and um, also virtual training. So that is sort of your, a little bit of a story of where we are today. And I think I'm turning it over to Devin to talk about the data that we can share with you today. Thank you. Thanks, Melly. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to be running through some numbers for attendance and chronic absenteeism and suspensions, uh, comparing this most recent fall to ones before. And uh, before I get started, I should say I, I'm Devin Corrigan. I'm the supervisor of analytics in the research planning and assessment department. I work for, for Dr. Kana. 
And with that, I think we can uh, jump in and go to the next slide, please. So I'll say off the bat, I know there's there's a lot happening on this slide here, um, which is true of most of our slides. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to orient you and, and always point you towards, you know, where you can find even even more information should, should you want it. So the first couple of things I want to say, if you can hear me okay, um, these are unmatched students. So we're not talking about a cohort of students that we're following over time, but rather snapshots of students taken at the times that I'm going to talk about. Um, I also wanted to mention that the all these slides here are going to have a link at the top. If you click the link, it'll take you to a PDF with many, many, many more numbers than you'll see on these slides. Um, <laughs> we already fit in a lot here, and we don't want to uh, to try to fit in too, too much and have it just be um, incomprehensible. So if you want to see the whole table and really roll your sleeves up and get into the, the full data, you can click through at the blue link uh, at, on the top, and I would encourage you to do that. So we're going to talk about a couple of different metrics when we look at attendance and absenteeism. Um, so I also want to point out that, you know, when we talk about average attendance, we're talking about, you know, daily attendance, the number of days attended over number of days enrolled as a fraction. And then we've got um, average excused absence, which is the same thing, but for excused, unexcused, same, but for unexcused. And percent chronically absent, as, as I'm sure everyone knows, it's, it's 10 percent is our cutoff. So just quite different. I want to point that out. You know, the numbers look very different looking at the column for average attendance versus the column for percent chronically absent. Um, average attendance is, is a continuous variable going, you know, from zero to 100, uh, whereas you would have um, this binary category for percent chronically absent, and that's why the numbers look quite different. So just a uh, quick orientation there. And then what I want to say in terms of the observations is that Comparing fall 2019 to fall 2021, you'll notice that there's a fall missing. Um, and that's, of course, because that was when we were engaged fully in distance learning. Um, but we do have this fall 2019 as a comparison semester uh, to this most recent semester, which is, uh, of course, fall 2021-22, which you see on the right there. So with that orientation for you, um, Really what we want to say is that we're seeing that the average attendance rates have decreased by about 2% overall. And we can see that the, the younger grades, TK through 5 and 6 through 8, are, are pulling that average down. And even if it's, it's 2 overall, we see bigger decreases at those grade levels. Um, similarly, for average excused absence rates, uh, we're seeing that they're nearly, they've doubled in that time and also, you know, being pulled by the same grades, TK through 5 and 6 through 8. For chronic absenteeism, we've seen about an 8% increase overall, and we see very large increases at TK through 5 and 6 through 8, particularly in the elementary grades. Uh, as always, you know, when, when our pay presents data, we want to show you trend data, we want to show you subgroup data, and so, you know, while we talk about these overall trends and they're important, we also really want to focus in on what we see in terms of gaps, and, and we do see gaps here. Um, so we've seen that gaps have widened uh, for average attendance, average excused, absence, and chronic absenteeism, so across all those different metrics. And a particular concern, we're seeing that very high chronically absent rates for African American students, Latinx students, and Pacific Islander student groups. Um, so that's mirroring, mirroring trends that we're seeing across the state, um, but that we are seeing, you know, really some some concerning data in terms of widening gaps and, and did want to point that out. Uh, I'll, again, point you towards the, the link there at the top for more. Um, sorry, can I just also add that one of the things about the fall of 2021 um, that we haven't really been able to dig in is the impact of quarantining on um, mm -hmm. absentee rates, either excused or unexcused, how well we manage that. And that was going to disproportionately impact um, the lower grades because the vaccine was not available until December for um, 5 through 11 year olds. So we will, we will, it will be interesting to see if some of that improves since we are now, we had um, starting in January and February, we had more elementary students um, vaccinated, which means you did not have to quarantine. And we have launched contact uh, group tracing at the end of March, which means no students have to quarantine. So we're able to keep students in school more. So that is also something that is some, the pandemic has also impacted. 
when we return to school. Sorry, are you are we seeing upticks in the monthly data since like in the spring? I'm sorry, monthly upticks for what? Sorry. Well, I'm saying I'm wondering what you were just saying, if that's the case. Like, oh. Are we seeing increases in attendance in the spring compared to the fall? That's what we hope to see. I mean, it's we, I don't think we've run the data, but because the fall students were being quarantined when, due to a positive case, we would have had more absences, excused absences than we should have in the spring because mm. students aren't being quarantined. No, I totally understand. That was what yeah. I was wondering. Like, we don't we don't have data from the spring yet. We have from preliminary this data. Spring. Yeah, like a monthly, like February or. <laughs> Uh, I actually just saw a preliminary report this morning. Yeah, so, I'm just curious. yeah, what I've seen is that we would have we had there's a, a predictable drop in January, like you'd expect given what was happening with Omicron. We saw a really big hit to the average attendance rate overall, and it climbed back up pretty quick, pretty quickly. You know, within three to four weeks, it was kind of back where it was before in December. So. I can show the chart, it's coming soon enough, but basically it dips the attendance rate and then it slowly climbs back up. But, but it's still, still lower, it's still yes. comparable to these numbers rather That's than right. back, okay. That's right. And I'm sorry to mean the confused thing, I also think post group tracing, which was March 24th, where nobody is quarantined for a positive, we hopefully will see an increase from that. I think it would be helpful if we had, um, other demographic groups in here, um, to, so white, Asian, just because then you can see some comparative, um, you can see, like for example, all things being equal, if people were quarantining during January, were they quarantining across the board? And so would that be reflected in the number side? If you have those numbers, maybe you can provide those later um, so we can see the sure. difference between the different demographic groups that are not presented here. I think there's a couple things to say there. One is that certainly for all the attendance data, we can provide all that information. And that's something that you would get by clicking through at the link. Uh, at the top, you would see all the groups. In fact, that squiggly line in the middle is meant to represent that. There's a lot more to list there, but we wanted to go easy on your eyes. Um, so that's all there if you click through. And as far as your question more specifically about quarantining, um, Melly may be able to speak more to this, but I, I know that there's some data collected about why someone might not be in school that's that's pandemic related, but I haven't seen any that we have reliable data to report. You know, this is this student was quarantining and the student was sick with COVID as opposed to the more sort of high level data that we've always collected about an excused absence. So I'm not sure we can get into that level of detail reliably. But certainly with the classic metrics of attend average attendance, chronic absenteeism, um, we break those down by every group you could you could think of just about. Uh, I have a question. So this is saying that pandemic has really impacted the um, absenteeism or attendance and is mostly the lower elementary and middle school. Um, however, I'm with my sons are at Galileo High School. The attendance there is um, a mess. <laughs> I'm not gonna miss words. And in addition to that, it just the tracking is, is always wrong. I have students and parents always complaining that they were there, but then they were marked absent. So just numerous cases like it. But in addition, there's a group of students who do not go to class. They're wandering around the halls all day are they absent? Are they there? Like, how are these numbers reflected in here at all, if at all? Yeah, so it's two different. I, two different, I might different, have the most high school experience here. <laughs> yeah, that, that last question, Typically, a high school student who's not in class would be marked absent for that period. Now, if they went to one class or more, then, then they would be marked present for average daily attendance purposes. But if they, uh, but if they didn't, so if they, if they went to one class, they would, the average, because the average attendance is basically ADA, right? right. Whereas like the minus, the, the under 90% at a high school level usually reflects 
the percentage of actual class time. Is it, am I getting this right? That's like my understanding. It's all daily attendance. Oh, it's, it's all daily attendance. Yeah. So for average attendance, it's the it's the so, daily attendance. So it's your your days attended divided by your days enrolled. Okay. And it's an average because it's average for all of whatever group right. we're talking about. So, so if it's district total, so, averaging that for everybody. So in high school, because this is also for like attendance reporting to the state, in high school, if you're in present in one class, you're considered present for average daily attendance. So if a kid is there, they go to one class and they spend the rest of the day wandering in the halls, they, that may, I mean, I don't know, that could be why these numbers aren't any lower because they would be regarded as present. It's a little different than elementary, whereas like there's typically just one attendance taker, right? Because it's one teacher. So any so any present is a present at at high school, typically. Yeah, for for, for ADA purposes. I think they, they are. There also is a way to record it. Most high schools would be looking at that, and if you there's reports like a skipped class report and all I mean so on an internal basis schools look at that but in terms of attendance reporting it would be considered present thank you and I don't want to take up more time here but I would like to meet with is it Devin or someone to understand this a little more please of course um, so there's nothing else on this one I can keep going um, we're going to go into suspensions now please so this is an overall snapshot of suspensions, it's suspension rates. So it's suspensions per 100 students um, as of the last slide and, and all others to come. I would point you towards the link in the title to see this in more detail. But this at least gives you a quick snapshot, a quick look, and also points you toward the, uh, the definition there at the bottom. So what we're seeing overall here is what we want to see. You know, with the directionality, we're seeing fewer suspensions than there were. Of course, you'll notice the zeros uh, in the middle column for each of the categories here, elementary, middle, high school, and overall, um, the zeros are, that's fall 2020, uh, when we were all in distance learning. Um, but comparing fall uh, 2019, that should say 2019 in the title, my apologies, 2019 to 2021, we do see a drop overall um, for each of these, these groups. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, that's that's never the whole story. And as I said um, a few moments ago, we, we always want to be looking at what gaps might exist. And so here we have elementary, middle, and high school groups um, represented in each of these visualizations, and then all these different um, subgroups. When you mentioned the acronyms earlier, I thought this might be one of the slides you're talking about. It is uh, chock full of them. Um, there is a guide there at the bottom. Um, to help with that, but this gets to that issue I was talking about earlier where we want to pack as much as we can into a slide and then it quickly gets very, very busy. So uh, the link again at the top would take you to more detailed data, but I can say at least um, pointing you towards some salient pieces in this in this particular slide, even as we see numbers down overall, which again is what we want to see um, in terms of the directionality here, we want to see the suspension rate going down. We see that in elementary, middle and high. But even in middle and high where we see more of a drop, we still see not only some subgroups where the suspension rate is higher than the average, um, but we also see that there were some groups for whom the suspension rate actually did go up a bit. We see that for African American students and Pacific Islander students, for example. Um, so I did want to point out that those, those are gaps that we're, we're focused on. When we look at this data, again, just sort of hammering away at this point here, we're, we're always interested in looking at data uh, over time, looking at these trends and breaking it down by subgroups and looking for these types of gaps. So that, that's really the, the biggest takeaway um, from this slide is looking at where we, we've got those those bars that are higher than the overall ones on the far left um, of this slide. So I know we've got a lot to get through and I'll pause there, but, but happy to answer any questions about this as well. Well, I'll ask, is there any, I mean, I've noticed the numbers, you, you mentioned Pacific Islander students and the suspensions and the Samoan students in terms of the, I mean, there's a dramatic decline in attendance 
for some one students is there what's our sense from talking with folks in the community as to what's going on there and what can be done about it So you're going to get a slide 11, the attendance, or are you looking at the slide? So, back to attendance. Yeah. yeah, I was saying attendance and suspension. So there's an increase in suspensions for Pacific Islander students at, at middle school and slightly at high school, although it's small numbers. But more so the attendance. The attendance is also really dramatic. The, I noticed for some one students in particular, the attendance drop was was dramatic. So what I, what I would say, and I definitely offer my colleagues to jump in, but um, specific to our Samoan Pacific Island students, but also with um, inclusive of our African American students, our um, students with with, um, with IEPs and our language learners, there, there are these trends that are similar, right, in terms of attendance and suspension. Um, and a part of it that we've gathered, you know, a little bit of it is just like it makes sense. But we've also spoken and heard the feedback from families and students. And so for attendance is, do I feel welcome and a sense of belonging in school? Um, for attendance is, do I feel engaged? Do I see myself reflected in the curriculum? And do I feel like my voice and my input and my ideas matter? Um, and, and, and that is both in speaking to students and families about attendance, but also in speaking with our, our students who are part of, for example, our ethnic studies classes, et cetera. Um, we have high numbers of, of students who are, you know, students who identify as students of color, who tell us the difference in terms of their experience and who actually said, and so I just don't go to those classes. Um, and so that's a little anecdotal, don't, don't, don't quote me um, on that is the reason, but that is for sure some of the trends we're seeing in terms of the reason. Similarly for suspensions, um, I, was, I was writing down, and, you know, for my, for my slides that we, we have to address mindset. And so there is a difference in, in, in oftentimes how um, a teacher or a staff member might respond to a certain behavior from, from kids, depending on what they look like, what they sound like and where they're from, right? And so. I was actually going to keep it to myself, but even looking at that elementary school um, suspension slide and we saw that the numbers had gone down, I wanted to distinguish that just because we are not sending kids home does not mean that we're not sending kids out of school. And so there's a lot that, of this, uh, this resolution and this work that doesn't speak to the implicit bias, the mindset issues, and the ways in which we as a system have to be anti-racist to really disrupt some of these data trends. So that's just the Nikki answer, Commissioner Alexander, but I think a lot of it is around the mindset and, and how we respond to students differently where you see this disproportionality in terms of both attendance and um, suspension. I, yeah, I would agree with that. And I also know that those communities were disproportionately hit with um, COVID in terms of positivity rates and potentially for um, needing to quarantine because a family member was positive and things like that. So we don't have good data on that. I mean, we can we know which of our students um, or staff reported being positive, but I would imagine that some of that that big drop is both for what Deputy Superintendent Ford Morthel mentioned, as well as I think there is definitely an impact of COVID being disproportionate in those communities. And I do, can I ask a follow-up? So one, I appreciate that response. I think it seems like it's right on. And the, I guess a follow-up, Chief Lau Smith, in terms of going back to the restorative practices thing, because in my experience, in addition to the cultural competency training for teachers and, and connecting better with students and families. I think restorative practices is an approach, especially when it's embodied, you know, into the life of the school and it's pre including things like proactive circles. So, and I heard, you know, I really appreciate the data you shared in the survey from 2019. And those numbers are kind of disturbing to me that only 22% of our schools have are, are places where 80% of teachers regularly use classroom circles because to me it seems like that's the kind of a practice that would address some of the things that um, Deputy Superintendent Ford Martel was just talking about. And so I'm wondering, do we have a plan to sort of, I mean, the research, sort of practice is a research-based approach. It, we know that it works when implemented well. I, I get that there's a resource constraint. So, but I'm, I'm curious, what are our plans around making, changing these numbers and or what would it take if it's a resource question i think again this is where i would like the board to really have to make some of these hard decisions when it comes to budget and as you know i think one of my frustrations with the budget process has been that sometimes it's been difficult to even get to that level of conversation where it's and then we end up in this situation where it's like 
as you and I have discussed, sites versus central, right? And it's like, so I'm arguing just keep the money in the sites, and but we're never really having the the conversation of actually we could invest a million dollars a year in restorative practices, and this is what we would get, but we'd have to give up X, Y, or Z in order to do so. But I'm, so I'm curious, like, do we have a plan that could be implemented if we had resources, or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think we have embedded restorative practices into many of the things that we have created in terms on the side of the student family services side, um, you know, the family partnership model, the coordinated care team approach and things like that. And so I think that, and, and I do think that there's many things on the curriculum side, um, I know that um, Blanking authentic partnership was a re really big part in the initiate wonder in the middle schools. So I think what we really are trying to do, and I know um, Nikki, Deputy Superintendent Former Thel, and I have, we we meet much more often than probably pre-pandemic our predecessors to to try to coordinate all this. So I think what we need next is just something that I think has we hear the board has been asking for, and we're sort of starting with this functional analysis, and we really wanna start looking at how do we design a budget that speaks to the um, the values and get to that sort of what I think of as like a forced choice. Like we have so many priorities and which ones are we going to, are gonna to bubble to the top. And so I know that's something that we're talking about a lot, but I do really believe that as a district, we've developed a lot of really great tools and. Um, resources to do it, and then it's like creating a program that implements with the response to intervention in schools, which is some of the work that's with the CSAFE plan. It's another acronym, <laughs> which you told me what it stands for, and now I've forgotten. Coordinated, Coordinated Early, Early Intervention Early. Services. Yeah. yeah. Intermediate, yeah. And so I think that some, in, in listening to the literacy presentation, like that's also some of it. Like how do we do that through our instructional core and then wrap around the student and family services? And I also think the opportunity that we're working really closely as we move towards um, social workers and nurses supervised day to day at the school level, there's a whole bunch of other systems that we're also gonna be, un not unwrapping, <laughs> talking with um, lead on how do we work together. So I think at the end, um, I guess my answer is, I think we have the content and the tools and the resources. I would say we don't have a plan or an idea of how much that plan would cost. Uh, this one's gonna add, you being nice tonight. I think we also, we just, we lack people and infrastructure, right? Because um, for, for any plan that we have, I mean, this whole resolution was a whole plan. The, the issue is that we don't have the, the consistent staff to build the capacity of the folks who are on the ground doing this and support them. So we have professional development, but it's, it's often optional. Um, and it, it's not necessarily ongoing at the, at the consistency that I, a classroom teacher who knows how to teach language arts, might need. But we know that any good PD um, is, is, is only as good as the folks who are implementing the practice in the classroom, which often means you need coaching to support that. And so you're not just looking at a PD, you're not just looking at a PD plan, you're looking at a PD plan with staff who can go in and support and coach a teacher in implementing that plan or a school team in implementing that. You also need people because again, I went to school to learn how to be a, a teacher to teach ABCs and one, two, threes, right? And now we're talking about social emotional. Now we're talking about responding to, to babies who get triggered. Now we're restored, right? And so, so you also need some folks who, who have some level of expertise outside of my expertise that I can rely on. And when I'm thinking about what are some interventions that this baby might need or how do I support this student differently, we're not just sitting here and doing our same five interventions that we know because those are the things that were, that were done when, when I was in school, et cetera. So I would offer that in addition to everything that um, Chief Melilla Smith said, don't get mad at me. We 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 knew we need those people, and I, as I think about the slide that is to come around next steps, that's one of the feedbacks that we're getting um, from site, from site leaders, and from lead is that, that that there is a muscle that needs to be built here if we want to do this work and do it well, and we need people to build that muscle, and we need people to actually create the systems and the structures to make sure that it actually gets implemented um, with fidelity, and that there's some ability to follow up and. Um, really support the, the folks who are supporting the babies on the ground. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I think that's that's also why the prioritizing has to happen because we can't do it all, um, as you all know. And I think, and I'll just for one, I mean, I've experienced it with restorative practices. I mean, when we were at June Jordan, we had started on this journey a little bit before this resolution passed. And when this resolution passed, we had intensive support from the district to be able to do this work. We had training, we had coaching, the, the first, 
generation of these materials that we have that are really good was developed back then. And it made such a huge difference because all of a sudden, I had stuff I could pull from, I had all these things, I could call people and say, oh, will you come and train our whole staff? And that made, I mean, it made all the difference in the world. And we, but we also weren't trying to do six things. We were saying, this is what we're focused on this year, along with one other goal around academics. So we had a school culture thing and we had an academic thing that we were going deep on. And, and, but we saw the results. We saw a decline in suspensions. We saw a decline in out of class referrals. We saw inc improved student climate surveys, all those things with that focus. And so I think, um, I would just hope that we all can kind of figure this out of like, how do we pick the things that we are, know are research-based and that we invest in them, right? And that we say, this is something we're gonna do across the district or in pilot you know, areas or grade levels, whatever it is, but then we go deep on two or three things rather than trying to, I think we've often just said, well, we've passed all these resolutions, we've done all this stuff, so we're just gonna um, do everything and not do it well, so. I'm I'm ready to help make some of those hard decisions, but I know that getting to that getting to that process is a challenge. But I just want to say I think we need to collectively do it. I, if we could just finish the, the presentation and then we'll. Um, I thought we had finished. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we were, I think there's I think there's a one can or two. Can you go can you go two we slides doing. over just to the just because we uh, sorry two slides forward to the last slide I think. next. Next. Okay. No, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Just because we've just started talking about um, continuing areas of needs and, and next steps, it just made sense to go here. Um, I, I think I've already spoken about just the need for um, consistent professional development that is not optional. Um, that is something that we've heard loud and clear. Um, just to the point that Commissioner Alexander just made, um, there were services and there were there were quote unquote experts or folks that you can call um, from the school site if you needed some additional support or if, if a case was was with, you know outside of your your bandwidth, and so there has been a, a call to revive and bring back um, what we had before, which is called the SFUSD consultancy. So these were folks who were um, who were staff members of SF F, what's the new SFCSD. Student and, family yeah. student and family services, the name changed recently, but, uh, you know, who, who a school can call and say, hey, can you come to this to this meeting? I need some support with this student. And that consultancy um, is no longer uh, available at the same frequency that it was before. Um, sites continue to need um, more help with interventions and just more resources of what outside of, of you know, my five tricks can I do to support um, this student? Of course, we, we're looking for more opportunities for sites to get together and share best practices and align around what they're doing. Um, and then, of course, the infrastructure. But the other thing that's the top one is that we need and we're moving towards having a shared understanding of what tiered interventions are and what tier one is. And, and um, I'm going to look at you, Commissioner Shu. You know, in the same way that tier one for instruction is about that first teach, the thing that everybody gets, and then the degrees of support changes as you go up the pyramid. That's the same idea when you talk about social emotional and behavioral support for students, right? And so there should be some, some basic practices and things that are in place school-wide. And if those things are implemented well, and if there's a positive culture, and if there's a, a culture of celebration, et cetera, then the, the students and the, the situations that need more intensive uh, intervention and support should actually get smaller, which is why the pyramid, as y'all notice, it gets smaller when it gets to the top, because the idea is you focus most of your energy on that first tier, on, on everyone. And what we know is that, um, across our sites, across SFUSD, folks have different understandings of what this tiered intervention should look like. And there are some places where, you know, the, the, the mindset and the thinking is, this is outside of my scope, so I need to send this kid out to someone else for someone else to do. And so that, that taxes the system, right? Because now you're getting a very expensive and, and um, intensive supports for a baby who maybe just needed this one little this one little thing. And so really getting us aligned as a system of what tiered intervention really looks like and what it should mean is, is one of the main things that we're saying we need to do as a next step. So I just wanted to hop to there because we were talking about next steps. Now, if we can go two slides back. We got some bright spots. There's lots of amazing things happening around this resolution and around this work. Um, the first that I want to highlight is that even when we went into distance learning, we saw so many of our schools and so many of our educators who were still focused on positive behavior support and making sure that our, our students felt welcome and a part of a community. Um, all of our sites, now, and I, I, I said, Lead, are you sure we can say all? Each school site has a coordinated care team. And that is an amazing uh, shift. Uh, the, the, the names of these teams have changed. And we, you know, during pandemic, we went to coordinated care. But this is probably the first time that we can say that every single school 
as any team. Yes, you agree with me, Miss? I'm looking at you, bro. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every single school. Now, but that's like baseline, right? That's now we have the structure and we got some people. And so again, back to building their capacity is gonna be the next step. Um, uh, many, if not all of our sites have specific PBS plans and school-wide behavior interventions. And that was modeled after the one that um, Melee and team created some years back. Um, as a system, we've identified a focus on family partnerships and that was actually identified last year. Um, and we wanted to make sure our, our families had consistent um, and coherent experiences across all of our schools. So that's been our work. LEAD has been working a lot more diligently to review um, site data around suspensions, referrals, and even attendance with their leaders during check-ins and during cohort meetings. So there's a regu more regular monitoring of that data and opportunities for us to respond when we see um, places where you know the suspension rates are high for certain demographics or the attendance issues are, are starting to sneak up. Next slide, please. And then, you know, really just trying to, as we, we always talk about, there's more work that needs to be done. And this, this slide just wants to celebrate the work that is happening with just some examples from different school sites. Um, we've really tried to include our students in our PBIS frameworks and our restorative practices. And so you see at the top, there's actually a little video um, that students made that helped their peers learn about wanted and unwanted behavior, which is a part of um, positive behavior intervention and support. You see on the right hand side on the top, a peace path, a restorative circle, I think from um, Malcolm X Academy. At the bottom, you see a student matrix where students are learning to kind of monitor and see what's the expected behavior, set goals around their engagement and track that. And then at the, the older grades, you'll see that there's students who are working together to plan assemblies, to do student weeks, to lead peer, um, peer events and morning meetings. And so this is just an example of some of the things that are happening at many of our sites Again, our work and our next step is to make it not where it's something that happens here or there, but it's a consistent experience across um, all of our school sites. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you so much. And also I wanna appreciate the celebrations of the good things that are happening across our district. Um, so if, I don't see any public, <laughs> but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> if you'd like to speak to this item, please approach the podium. We have one minute. All right, uh, commissioners, any more comments? Or? I already had my discussion. <laughs> Commissioner Shu? Um, so this resolution was passed in 2014, right? And I hear Commissioner Alexander say that before, there had been good outcomes. And, and is it because of the pandemic that we kind of, or, or what happened that? I, the, it was, sorry. <laughs> Um, I think mostly it's a resource and, and many, many other resolutions were passed between 2014 and now. And as, as Nikki said, our, our attention got split on many, many things. So you, you lose the funding resource, as I mentioned, the million dollars because of, out of the SACE funding. And then a lot of other focuses that the same people are being asked to do many other different things. So for us to do the coordinated care approach and implement the restorative practices and do the Latinx uh, resolution and all of the other very important work. And I think it gets to what Commissioner Alexander was saying is we didn't prioritize, we just added. And so it's sort of like the newest thing that comes up becomes the next thing that we put whatever resources we have in. And that means it's taken away from another place. Can I just add on to that um, as well? Because that's very accurate. Sites have been tasked with more, um, for lack of a better word, jobs from our central office. So, like right now, site administrators have to do their own hiring, all this, you know, stuff like through Empower that they never had to do before. And that's a, that's not from the board. That's not a resolution. That's more duties that are. And you know, this is as a principal. I know it as a principal firsthand. Um, your your combination plate is already full, and they've added another taco. Um, so it overfloweth. And so, yes, there are have been board resolutions, and this is one of them, which I happen to agree with this resolution. Um, but there's also been a lot more put on sites, um, what they have to do to satisfy what central office wants them to do. And that's been a historic problem in this district. And I just want to add, with my site leader hat on, there's also the reality is a lot of sites are doing these things on teachers are staffing these committees and these groups right on top of their all day job and it's oftentimes and the two principals can say if it's true or not for their sites but in my experience it's the same teachers who are on 
all the different committees. So at some point, again, then the, the system gets taxed and folks are not really able to really move the work as, as they could if that was something they were really able to, to focus on. And stipends help, but you're, you're adding still another set of duties on top of my, my full day job. So that's been a challenge, especially for those sites that only have like, we were talking about this today with uh, Ms. Rice Mitchell and cohort three. Some sites have, you know, small staff as well. So it's the same 10 people doing everything. And at the risk of being too philosophical, I mean, I think there's that saying every system is designed perfectly to get the results it gets, right? And I think so with these, I think with these changes, we're tra actually trying to do something a little bit countercultural, right? Restorative practices is not the norm in schools. So, I mean, kids are still going to show up and, you know, people are going to do math or English to the best of their ability and in in whatever's happening. So that's why I think the additional resources become necessary because like, like you were saying earlier, we need coaching and support uh, because we're also supporting teachers and other school staff to change how they do things in order to get different results, whether that's improving how they teach reading or improving classroom climate, which also improves how kids learn reading. But I think I agree. I think the analysis is that is that we've done too many instead of focusing on here's our three high leverage strategies to do that. We've said here's 27 different things and, and it's kind of the flavor of the of the year. Um, I've seen a lot of that happening. So that falls on us to prioritize so that the staff can do three things instead of 10 or a dozen. Is that what we're saying here? I think it's a combination of what the staff's capacity is, as well as what the board feels are the priorities. Um, because we're all one team, we're not, it's not an us versus them. Um, so we have to work with our staff to figure out what the priorities are. And like, for example, the restorative practices training, that, that came before this resolution. That was Kim Shreem Office's resolution, I think two years prior to that. We focused a lot of attention and resources to get school sites up and running with the restorative practices. Then this resolution came and added on to that, which was a good thing, I think, at the time. When we had the resources to get it off the ground, but it petered out over time because there were competing interests, but also because it was the, a new flavor coming down. Um, but I've always supported this resolution because I think it, there are, it's sound. There are, certain, there are things within it that really support a positive climate for our schools, particularly the schools that are struggling the most, so that they can have kids coming to school feeling like they belong, as has been said, and also helping to change the mindset of the, the adults in the room and in the building so that they can change their perception of certain students in our district have historically been targeted, in, in my view. Um, and then that's why they don't want to come to school. So I have two more questions. One is, um, is there a list of all the things that, all the resolutions and all the priorities that uh, you've been tasked with? Does somebody have a list? Maybe we can put together a list so that we can try to examine and prioritize. We do, there is a, what a, a board resolution tracker, which I, I, I know that we have, and I'm sure we can make it available. We'll, we'll talk to G, Chief Hogendike about that, but uh, yes, it exists. Be, that'd be great, yes, thank you, if you can provide that. Uh, second question is, to this particular restorative practice um, resolution, the, is there data showing outcomes like increased graduation rates or better test scores or something like that associated with this practice being implemented? So, so um, I think we're still, I think we have both anecdotal and school specific experiences where school really dug into and implemented the resolution where we may be able to see and increase. It's always very hard, as Chief Connor would say and Devin would say, is to do a cause and effect because we did this graduation rates increased. Um, where we were when sort of the res implementation of the resolution got stalled because of the resources was really being able to measure the tiered fidelity inventory. That was the reason for doing that, to look at if a school was implementing positive behavior interventions systems practices you know 85% of the time and the and we just started measuring restorative practices like it was happening at June Jordan but we didn't know what was happening across the entire district 
So being able to look at those two things and then have some confidence in the fidelity of the intervention would be at a time where then we could look at, because of this, we have higher um, graduation rates. I mean, that's the thing about trying to get to data is you have to have fidelity of inf intervention and you have to be methodical, which I'm hearing the commissioners talk about, of what you're doing to see if it ha it is making the differences you want to make. Um, well, and that's another reason why you can't do 16 things, because then you don't know what actually worked, you right? You conflate <laughs> everything, right? And I mean, there's, and I would just say the only thing I would add is I think there's interim data points. Like for us, one of our big trackers was out of class referrals, right? So those hall walkers at Galileo, right? If you implement, I, I would argue, my theory of action as a principal would be if as our, our staff, we, we all commit to restorative practices and engaging in cultural tier one interventions that are gonna keep kids in classrooms, that we're gonna see a reduction in those numbers, right? And we would track, we would track attendance in classes, we would track, you know, maybe we'd have people walk the building and say, how many people do we see in the halls and just do some data collection that way. But I think that would be, like at a school-based level, you can absolutely track that. And then I think you can extrapolate, I mean, you can not extrapolate, but um, take that up to the level of the district. I just have a couple comments actually. Well, one is that in the past reports, um, we've included um, police detentions and arrests as one of our data points. Um, and uh, they are predictable, of course, the outcomes there. And then also secondary referrals out of the class. So, because we do have those, that they're not like elementary, elementary doesn't really have actual referrals, <laughs> um, but secondary does. And so when we look at that, when we total the out of class time from referrals to suspensions to detentions, to expulsions, like you, you will get a better picture of which kids are actually not in school. And you add on the chronic absenteeism, uh, then you really get a better picture of really how much time kids are actually not in, I'm beating a dead horse, I know, um, in the classroom, availing themselves of the expertise of their teachers and their peers. So um, the, I would hope that in the future we can also have the, those data points embedded in the report. So, yeah, so two things on that. Um, as you know, the Board of Education decided to end the um, memorandum of understanding with no, the No, I know, but there still are detentions. <laughs> there still are police being called to sites. Yeah, we have some of that data, but we don't have detention. So we know when a po we, we are tracking whether or not the police came to, were called to our schools versus the data we used to share with you is from the SFPD. So we can share the former in the board presentation. So that's helpful for clarity. Um, the other thing you're talking about is out of class discipline referrals. I think we call them ODRs. And that was the collection of those referrals was through a system that we don't have any longer due to budget cuts. And the um, reporting of that was was um, not consistent across all schools. So even the data we were sharing wasn't, it wasn't, um, it didn't reflect what was happening at all schools. But we can definitely give, share the data that we have for um, the number of times the police were called to a school uh, as we, part of that. Do we know who which kids are being, for example, questioned by the police if they're called in? Um, I don't know if we have, so when, if police come to a come to the campus and request to question a, a student, we have a board policy that requires a policy and for schools to um, fill out a form. I'm a, I don't have that data. I guess we can ask the lead because it, it doesn't it no. isn't collected um, centrally, but it would go to the lead uh, superintendent assistant superintendent. Right. So Nikki and I can look into what okay. about the actual versus our principals who are also required to call the police under certain circumstances calling the police to our campus versus having a police officer come show up. So is there in the future, is there a way that we can capture referrals even though we're not, I mean, is there a way, to, I mean, that, that's really important information. I mean, when I got to um, Horace Mann as the principal, there were 1,700 referrals there were only 300 kids, there were 1,700 referrals the year before I got there. So that was a really good, you know, for me as the uh -huh. incoming principal, I knew I had to reduce that. That was my theory of action, yeah. right? Like if there are fewer referrals, kids, kids are in their classroom, right? Yeah. So they're getting more and, learning time. Yeah. 
I think right. it's important. Whatever we hear about, we capture, but I, I don't know if we hear about everything, so it's another system to think about. There's the synergy monitoring as yeah. well, but. It's not consistently right. used. We have a lot of systems collect data, and but it's not consistently. Are we still using basis? Hmm? Basis? We don't have basis anymore. That was one of the things that ended with the budget cut. We were trying to shift over to, and there was a lot of confusion, like is it basis, is it synergy? We only want one system to report to. So we were working, this was pre-pandemic. We spent about a year, again, a pretty um, robust conversation about how do we take the synergy, some new modules, I think it's called the response to intervention. It's a different module that can go on to synergy to capture some of these things, but that got stalled due to resources and with the pandemic. So we collect information that we know is coming into us about um, police um, referrals. And so we're doing a lot of things not as systemically as we would like to. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, so this, we're required to file update twice a year, is it? For this resolution? For this resolution, there are two presentations a year. Forever? I'm sorry? Forever? Oh, uh, in perpetuity, I guess. <laughs> I was actually going to bring that up. Thank you for saying that. Um, because the resolution isn't necessarily being implemented <laughs> to the fidelity we would like, obviously, um, I think that the board can... Um, modify that requirement that's in the resolution. Um, obviously, we can do whatever we want, but um, <laughs> that, um, I, th I think that we might want just something that is presented to the board through electronically, but not presented. Right, we can do meeting. written, and the resolution that it doesn't specifically say it has to be a presentation, we can do we a written update that, that, as well. That's just been our practice. So yeah. um, if there's no objection, I think that we can make that the future practice, unless there's something the changes, <laughs> um, do you want to? Well, I'm just wondering, I mean, this is a longer conversation, but I'm wondering if we can move toward having a system of priorities and we're saying that's based on a strategic plan. So instead of that's, the board passing. I just have to say that that's out of the scope of this this committee. Is your, I mean, you're right. I mean, but that's, I agree, we should do that, but we can't really have that discussion here. I think that's a, we'd have to agendize that as a, as an item, if I, am I correct? Yes, I mean, the full board would have to put it on and then refer it to committee, maybe, yeah. I, I was just saying, as a general principle, as an alternative to reporting on individual resolutions, I wonder if we could propose to board leadership an, a system where I agree. the board and superintendent are setting priorities and that and that we don't pass new resolutions that don't aren't part of that, right? That the resolution might amend that, but it's not gonna, I, that's I all. Do resolutions die? Ever? So, I'm sorry, that tracker would really help. <laughs> Just so there is a tracker. Um, I did, we just really can't discuss all, much more out of the scope of this. Um, well, can we ask for, I mean, yes. I'm saying as an outcome from this committee, can we ask for leadership? Yes. To, yeah, yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least look at the, all the resolutions. Yes, yeah. so that, all of us together. And I would just say something? that there are also administrative policies that have been passed that we don't track that, that die also, yeah. right? That just <laughs> become out of favor, right? So both happen. There's, yeah. There are things that are driven solely by administration for administrators to do and to move to the sites to do, and those fluctuate over time as well. But we don't track those. <laughs> But if they're dead, then they're dead. We don't care, <laughs> we don't care. that they're not using anymore <laughs> people's times. Right. It's the ones that are actively being worked on, and there's so many. That's the ones that we need to review. And, you know. OK, so for future discussions, <laughs> I'll be happy to talk to the board leadership about that. OK, um, so with that, thank you all. I know it was a long meeting. Um, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. And th thank you for your work. Thank you.